Hey there, I'm Ryan. Welcome to today's acrylic landscape lesson. All of the tools and materials will be listed in the video description. And if you'd like help with the drawing process, I will have the traceable up over on Patreon along with the reference photo for color matching. If you're interested, check it out. But with that, let's jump into it and have some fun. So we're going to begin here today with a one inch flat headed brush because we want something with a lot of surface area to cover our base layers. With that, I am going to dip the bottom third of it in a little bit of water to help extend the wet life of our paint and condense the bristles. But with that, I'm going to head to my palette and we're going to start with three different pigments. We have a sap green, a Mars black and a titanium white. I will put an image up on screen of all of the tubes so you know exactly which brands I'm using. But with that, we're going to start with grabbing quite a lot of our Mars black and moving that to a new spot on our palette. We'll grab about one tenth that in our titanium white and we'll grab about one tenth that in our sap green. From there, we'll mix it all quite thoroughly and we'll start applying this to the base here of our canvas. Going to be working initially in horizontal strokes, as you can see, and I'll work my way up. But as we do continue to work our way up, I'm going to slowly interject more and more of our sap green and our titanium white. So I just doubled up both of those amounts right there. Now I'm heading back in, and it's not making a dramatic difference at all, but that's what we want. We want the entirety of this first base layer to actually be quite dark, that way we have a lot of contrast as the foreground generally demands it. With that, I'd like to show you a little bit closer just how much pressure I'm applying with my brush as I go ahead and do this. Now here we're going back in with about triple the amount of green and titanium white, but as you can see from my brush strokes, especially as I blend downwards, it's very soft. I'm not applying much pressure at all, and if I were to, my bristles would, as you can see, really expand to the left or right, and you start creating a line on the top and bottom of your brush. So, when you want a really smooth gradient, apply very minimal amounts of pressure, and you'll get something significantly softer. I'm also working it over a couple of times just to ensure that we get what we want. But with that, yet again, I'm going back, adding about another tenth of that titanium white and Mars black keeping it nice and subtle. And here you can see we are progressively making it brighter. That's getting a little chalky. We don't want that. And in that scenario, generally the best course of action is to just go back and add more paint. We don't want to drag it out from other areas because in that scenario you do have to apply more pressure. That is not what we are aiming to do. With that, let's get a little bit of a wider angle for you, and we'll complete this step. Now, as you move farther back here, the larger gradient is more apparent. I'm going to avoid the larger trees that we have here in the foreground, at least the base of them. Though, if you do end up covering it up, don't worry, you can always go back and just redraw it in. That said, we did essentially our line, so I'll go back to the palette, add more green, more white, and we'll continue building as we move up towards the sunset that we have. That is correct, Howie. I'm not sure if you could hear that, but we do have some interjection from my studio assistant, which is my lovely little boy, Howie. Great cat. And here, we're just going to go up to this line. I'll even work vertically around the trees briefly and then I'll move that into more of that horizontal application. By the way, if you do get a couple of different colors showing up in here, a little bit of Mars black where it shouldn't be, a little bit more titanium white, it is okay. This is just a base layer. We're going to cover just about all of it, but we do want a nice thick base layer, so if you can still see any of that canvas showing through, do go ahead, just let that dry, and apply another layer before we move on to the next step. But with that, I'm quite happy. So, let's switch our brush and start working on some detail. 
So now we're going to start working on the distant grass that we have still in the foreground, as you can see in the reference photo, a lot of tiny detail. And we're going to do that with the fan brush. Now this is a stiff bristled fan brush. So when I grab paint or make an application, the bristles do remain fairly individual and therefore sharp, which is great for that very finite detail. But I'm actually not going to blend with this brush initially. I'm still going to be using the one inch flat headed brush as it's just ideal for moving around larger amounts of paint. With that, we are going to be using the same mixture that we had for the top of this. However, now I have some cadmium yellow deep hue on my palette. It's a bit of a warmer yellow, great for sunsets and you know different scenarios like that. But we're actually going to grab about one third of this equal to our current mixture. We'll work that in. It's going to make it a little bit warmer, a little bit more yellow, not dramatically so. And then we'll also brighten it with about a third of our titanium white. And as you can see, that's going to desaturate our pigment a little bit, but bring us to something that can stand out against our darker backdrop. This isn't our final highlight. We will be building it up, but it's a great start and I like to work in layers. That said, here we have our fan brush. We'll grab some of it just on the tips and we don't want too, too much because we don't want to condense the bristles. But with that, we're going to go in with a bit of a tap and the slightest drag downwards for the backing grass here. We want to leave markings in between all of these applications. That way we create some depth. And the majority of these applications are going to occur in the center of the canvas. And as we start to run out of paint, we move to both the left and the right hand side. And we do this very purposefully. So the majority of the highlight builds up in the middle of the canvas and we get a slight vignette effect, which does bring the eye again in towards the middle as the eye neatly goes to the brightest point of any piece. That said, as I move down here, I'm going to start creating a bit longer of an application and I'll get you a little bit closer for the detail work. So essentially, due to perspective, as we move closer to us in the painting, we get to see more finite detail. And that means all of these little pieces of grass and all of these markings are going to become more and more present. I'm only going to go down to about the halfway point here as we're going to get into some larger grass that's a bit more open, but we do want a progressive change from the top being more of a tap down to a bit more of a tap and drag and a larger drag the farther down we get. That said, we're not just creating all horizontal lines. I'm going to create some that connect with each other. So you can see this one moves through here. And this is going to create openings, make it look significantly more natural. And when you're doing this, you may want to consider if your piece is going to have a lot of wind in it. This one isn't going to be, there'll be a slight lean to the larger grass, but the majority of it is going to stand fairly straight, if not have a little bit of a lean to the left. So do consider that when you're making these strokes, but don't make them all the same, or it might seem a little too repetitive. Now we are going to be switching to our smaller liner brush, and we're going to be doing this to render individual larger pieces of grass in the foreground, and technically, all of our grass here is going to be the same height, but as it gets closer to us, it appears larger, and therefore we paint it with more unique detail. So we're going to switch to this. I'm going to be grabbing the same highlight that we were working with beforehand, as I do want there to be good unity within the painting. And I'm going to start right here in the center. When I first press my brush to the canvas, I'm going to apply very minimal amount of pressure then I'm going to add slightly more as I move down the stroke, and then I'm going to relieve it and lift the brush off the canvas. Let's go ahead and do that a couple times. And I'm going to be a bit more centered. Okay, that's stroke number one. Let's go back, make sure our brush is nice and damp. Good, number two.
Number three. Still have quite a bit of paint on my brush. Number four. Five. These are all leaning this way. Let's apply one to kind of change that general motion. Six. And they're not all going down to the same bottom point. I am trying to add some level of diversity. And the idea that you can't see the bottom is that it's getting down to an area that doesn't get enough light to show detail. So this does go down farther. We just can't visually see it because there isn't enough present light. Now when I was explaining pressure at the beginning, I was doing so because when you apply a minimal amount of pressure, your bristles stay very tight together, right? And that means we're going to get a very small marking. And as you apply more pressure in the middle, you get more of that contact, your bristles spread out more, and therefore, we end up with something that's a bit larger. So, you can see more of the body of the grass in the middle. And then we relieve pressure at the bottom so that we end up with something smaller yet again. So there's a lot of dimension despite the fact that we're just painting these curved lines, right? Trying to ensure that as we get farther back here, my strokes are getting smaller and smaller to the point where they essentially match the length of what we have in the background. And as I noted, I am just beginning in the center area. We are going to expand to the left and right hand side, but I want there to be different clumps and clusters. It's really important for making it look unique and natural. Also to give you very definitive areas to look at so that it doesn't become too visually clustered or clumped. So here we just have small little markings at the top, again getting lost into the previous grass and you can move these throughout, but we want a good gradient of sizing. We started with a gradient of hue, now gradient of sizing for our perspective and our depth. With that, let's get you a little bit closer and we'll start working on our second cluster. Then we can go back to this one once we have an idea of how much detail and how much grass we can apply. But we're only going to know that when we can see it in relation to other clusters. Now our second cluster is going to occur just to the left hand side. We're going to leave a bit of a gap here. And so I'll start with a smaller couple of pieces for the side of this one, just so that we have a visual introduction to the cluster and then they can get a lot larger as you move slightly closer to us but also farther away from this one. And I also don't want it to get too overgrown towards the left either because I still want that vignette effect which means we're going to need the edges to be darker and therefore also less detailed as this is really the brightness and the subject that brings it in there. So lots of overlapping grass. Again, that's a great way of indicating depth. You also want some grass to be thicker than others. We are going to now start moving upwards, have our grass get smaller, but I'm actually not going to move straight up. I'm going to move in this general direction. So again, just making it a bit more dynamic, a bit more visually captivating. I know we're just painting grass and we have been for quite a few minutes and we're going to continue for quite a few minutes, but I hope this goes to show that there isn't just one way to paint grass. There are multiple ways and often those different ways are done in the same painting due to perspective and how far or close your grass is, right? So these are different things to consider and they are going to make your painting look a whole lot better, a whole lot more professional in the end. The grass right now still admittedly looks fairly flat because we haven't built up any layers. We don't have added values to make it really interesting, but we will get there, so don't you worry. And here I'm just throwing in some smaller markings so that it feels more cohesive. And we also, now that we have the majority of these established and the fact that there are two different clusters, we're going to throw in some smaller ones in between just to show that there are going to be some larger pieces that do poke out. 
going to be a bit slower with applying these as I really want to think about where they're going to be as I don't want to fully connect them but I do want them to look a bit more naturally uh, the same subject right so I like that a lot I think it is a good amount of detail could maybe have a little bit more so we'll throw that larger piece in there but all of that made me realize I could definitely go ahead and do more in this one as well so we'll just apply a couple of strokes not going to overdo it not going to do a lot again not going all the way to the bottom though I might with this yeah I like that dimensionally quite a bit okay and this one again We'll fill in more of that transition area towards the back. And this one doesn't go straight back. It also has a bit of a lean towards the right. Though we do need another cluster. So let's take a step back so we can get a good view of our painting, where we've come and where the next one needs to begin. I also am looking at the reference photo through all of this so I have a general idea but I am going to take artistic liberties throughout our journey here. Now, as we step back here, I do really like what we had. I ended up just adding a little bit of a darker pigment to the bottom here, just because I didn't like how far these went down. But aside from that, it's a good amount for what we have. And now let's continue on our next cluster, which is going to be right over here. These are going to extend to the bottom of the canvas, so I'll just establish that now and they are going to move up right through here with that same general movement so again applications at the top much smaller overlapping one another and these are actually going to be leaning for the most part to the right so these are a bit more to the left for the most part we do have some to the right these are for the most part to the left and the idea with the general sway and the motion is that you're always following the tops of them into the canvas right so it is purposeful it does imply not too much wind because if there was a lot of wind the majority of the grass would move in a uniform motion right instead of just being able to fall naturally and we are going to go for a fairly natural look at the end here once we end up building up our highlights adding on our flowers and really bringing this to fruition remember we're still in the very early stages of the foreground but this is all essentially how we start building it now I am going to create some small little pieces in between these to join them together like we did that to a small extent, not a large one. We do need these smaller applications at the top here. And as I'm almost out of paint, I'll work over on the right hand side, the area that does still need to be quite dark because we want that vignette effect, but when we don't have much paint and it's quite watery, that's the best time to do this. So, three different clusters working together quite well. Like that one, really like the transition there. I now feel like this one needs a bit of a better transition upwards. So we don't really complete one area of grass and then move to the other. We work on one area of grass, see how it interacts with the others, and then go back to it until we feel like all of them are essentially where we want them to be. Here's a bit more filler in the middle, now that my brush doesn't have much paint on it. And a little bit more down towards the bottom. We'll do that to the left hand side as well. I'm actually going to make this mixture a bit more watery. I get uh, quite a lot of questions about my water usage, actually, and how much I'm applying to the brush. It really is, on average, what you see at the start of the video when I show it the first time, where we dip it into the water, I wipe it off a couple of times and then I head to the canvas. However, when you really want transparent pigment, you might only wipe it off once, maybe twice, but I always do wipe it off even when I'm building up to a glaze because a lot of water can be really difficult to work with. There we go. 
really like that. I think we're just about ready to add some highlights. And if in that process we realize, you know what, I want more detail here, we can always go back and add it. Now for the next step, we are going to be looking to the back of the reference photo as we are going to continue adding highlights to what we've already applied. I'm going to be working with the fan brush yet again, but for mixing, we are of course back to the one inch flat headed brush. So for this, I'm actually going to grab quite a lot of our cadmium yellow deep hue, move that right off to the side of our current mixture unless it's fully dry, but I do want to be able to compare and contrast the two, so I want it close. With that, I'm going to grab an equal amount of our titanium white. This is going to thicken the pigment as our cadmium yellow is inherently quite thin, but it's also going to help us ensure that we get something a bit more desaturated, something we can build on. Then I'm going to grab about one fifth that in our sap green and we'll work that in. And we'll grab about one eighth that in our Mars black and work that in. The Mars black is a lot stronger than the sap green so we're using less of it. But we're essentially trying to mute our yellow a little bit. We'll double up the amount of green we had this is a really nice yellow, but it's something I want to build up to. So, I think this is actually a great next step. And we'll leave a hint of the initial yellow on the side so that we can remix to it later. But, get as much of this paint off my brush as I can, put that down, we'll switch to the fan brush, grab that on the tip, and we'll head towards the back. Yet again, the back is done with essentially a bit of a tapping motion. Very simple, working horizontally. As you can see, when we start to run out of paint, we can move to the actual sides. We want things to be quite uniform farther back because we're not going to see a lot of the detail and separation in the different clusters of grass. But as we start to move forward, we start to create larger separation. I'm trying to work predominantly on the areas that we've already applied, but if we feel like we need to change things up as we get highlights, we can go ahead and do that. And then again, as you move closer to us, starting to incorporate more of a drag in my tap so that we can see the tops of grass sticking out. We're not going to grab any water. Remember, this brush is really the only brush or one of the very few that we don't actually add water to. It works better if we don't. So we'll apply this. And this is something that you might want to go back over a couple of times. It might look a little bit thin, a little bit awkward initially, but with time and application you can get it to look really nice. There we go. Going back over a lot of this, especially at the top here, the light is going to be coming from up over the hill. So the closer we are to it, the more most all-consuming light we have. And then that light is more spread apart as we get towards the foreground, as we move farther away from it, and as we see more contrast because we are just closer to subjects. Now, I definitely think we need to do a bit more with the sides. We've been very careful not to overdo it, and I think in that process we've kind of underdone it a little bit. So, as I run out of paint, move over here, doing this tap and drag, getting higher, moving over to just a tap. There we go. And more of it at the top, of course. We'll just let it dissipate as you move down. Same goes for this side. From the side view here, I think it's quite evident that we have these different little patches and clusters. So here we have one, there's another one under it, and the fact that we're not adding highlight in between further strengthens the fact that there are a couple. Again, we want less of that as we move closer and closer towards the actual sun, but I think it's a really nice technique and we're going to make them more individual as we get closer and closer to us. So, 
We're getting quite close to the foreground. I'm letting my brush go down much farther, but it's really running out of paint, which is good. Makes it look like elongated grass, which is being lost down there. Okay, so far so good. We may go back and add additional highlights and all of that to these areas, but for now I'm happy. And we are going to switch back to this brush so that we can mix up a bit more paint so that we can work on the larger grass as well. Remember, it's about an equal mixture of our titanium white and our cadmium yellow deep hue. I ended up going with about an equal mixture of the sap green after all of the additional mixing and then a very small hint of the Mars black. I'll just get as much as of that off the brush as you can. Grab our liner brush. Make sure it is nice and damp. There we go. And now we'll take our pinky finger. This is something that I did earlier, didn't talk about it, but I do like to ground my pinky finger on a hard surface. Generally, it's the easel. That way I can eliminate shake from my hand when I make applications like this. I'm going to be doing this to the tops of the grass for the most part, and I'll let it dissipate as you move down towards the middle of them. I'm also going to be a bit more quiet through this part of the process, just because it does require quite a bit of concentration and stillness. I start with the most important pieces, and then I expand. So the ones that are necessary for form and showing dimension. We get smaller as you move up towards the rest of these and we're at a point where I think they actually blend really, really nicely together. Remember this middle area is going to have pieces that go to the left and to the right. We are going to have flowers on top of a lot of these as well, so don't feel like you need to overdo it. Here we'll work our way down to the cluster on the right hand side. Remember we're starting by just going over the top of a lot of these. As you run out of paint, we can move towards the darker areas, so the connective strands that are between our larger clusters as well as the spots off to the left and the right. We can still have a couple of that stick out, just not too many. Don't want it to take away from the larger movements or areas. There we go. I'm also working very closely with the canvas right now and soon we should really take some steps back and just make sure that we're doing the right amount in the right areas up close. We really focus on detail, making sure that all the little pieces look great, but it's when we're standing farther back that we recognize if the piece as a whole works and what we need to do to make it more cohesive, right? Because realistically, for the most part, you're looking at a painting from 10 feet away normally, not half of a foot. So just something to consider. Let's take it back a little bit and work on this together with a wider perspective. So here we have it from a distance. As you can see, it is getting brighter. I like that. I like how spaced out it is. I like how we have a couple little strands that combine it. We kept this area darker, but we extended these. 
We have the general motion of moving this way. We have this moving in both directions. And now I do think we are ready for the other side. So again, we grab some water, we grab some pigment, and we'll look for the most prominent pieces, grounding my hand. Predominantly going over the ones that we've already done, but again, if you feel like you want to take an artistic liberty or there's just an area that could use it that isn't currently highlighted or has grass, you're more than welcome to do that as well. I am looking at the reference photo still for my general motions and all of that. We do definitely need to continue warming up the grass and we'll do that with further highlights in the next step, but right now we are still just trying to ensure that all of these work well together. Lots of pieces that cross one another. And I feel like I need more water. I feel like these applications are a little bit larger than the ones that we've done previously and I'm just applying more pressure than I, than I need to. So more water, less pressure. And we'll just have it get smaller at the top. As you run out of paint, we can go into the middle sections. Again, might get a little quiet for different portions just because it is something that requires quite a bit of concentration. We're not just applying them wherever, we are being mindful of our applications. Also going back and extending a couple of the pieces that I really like and that I feel should get slightly more attention. Okay, I like that a lot, but because some of the markings were larger than what we had in the left and right, or in the center and right, I'm going to go back and just make a couple of these slightly larger as well. Just so that it all fits together. As I noted earlier, we don't work on one area of grass and finish it, then move on to the other. We work on one area of grass, and then we move on to another, and then we move back. <laughs> and that's the process of getting it done right. I'm not going to make these too large. Really don't want to take away from the center too much. There we go. Okay, I like that a lot. I think we need slightly more. Very subtle pieces connecting. And to the side. You can also use your finger to soften them. Gives it a bit of a Boken effect. You can see a bit of a darker mixture, which I like within our larger mixture. We can use that for the sides in those areas. There we go. Really nice. Now for the next step, we're going to go for an even brighter variant of that yellow. Remember we did mix some up, so let's grab a good amount of our cadmium yellow DPU, about an equal amount of our titanium white. We'll go with about a third of that in our sap green. And we do want this to remain yellow, so we'll see if that was too much. I think we are safe. But we do need to darken a little bit, so we'll go in with a hint of Mars Black. And by a hint, I mean maybe 1 20th. Very, very minuscule amount in comparison to the rest of our mixture. We do need to be careful with black and yellow, because often they do turn into a green. And while that wouldn't be the worst thing, we do want to transition more so towards the yellow. So I have what I want. Going back to my fan brush, it was washed but I did let it dry fully. 
We'll grab this, head up to the top, do that tapping motion, start working our way down, integrate a little bit of a drag, start creating some openings but not too many. Though you can create a lot of openings initially and then just go back and fill them in. So don't ever feel like you are creating too many. If you're going to kind of overdo one thing or the other, whether it be filling in space or not filling in enough, you'd rather err on the side of not, not filling in enough. This is going to look awkward, by the way, for a little bit. Do brace yourself, it is okay. We will find an aesthetic end. We're going to go over the back area a number of times, really building it up. Often it looks more awkward when you have too much contrast in the background with such stark pigments. Here we're really working on the edge, something we neglected in the first path. There we go. Lots of tapping here. Grab a bit more. Also, if you don't want it to be too, too saturated, another yellow you could use is Naples yellow. It's a very inherently desaturated yellow. I wanted something a bit warmer. Something that felt a bit brighter, but if you do want it to be a bit more subtle, Naples yellow is a great replacement for the cadmium yellow DPU. Additionally, we have some, I believe that's, it's either lemon yellow or cadmium hue light hue. At this point, I've forgotten. I haven't used it. It's there in case we want it, but we'll see what happens. Though this will probably be bright enough for me. So here I'm continuing to just connect that backing area. And bring us closer into the foreground. Now, as we continue to layer all of these tapped applications on top of each other, they can start to look a little bit messy. So we are going to go in with the finer liner brush and we'll just clean things up, not only in the foreground as we go over the larger grass yet again, but also in the background as well. This is following a similar rule to the last application, by the way, back here anyway, in that we're not applying it to the entirety of our blades of grass, really just going in for the top, the areas that will catch the most light, and the most prominent pieces of grass. You don't need to do all of them. In fact, I'd recommend not doing all of them. The ones that sit lower, that don't catch light, can leave those out. But here I'm going to work my way up, as you can see, and try to make some of these markings just a little bit sharper give them some additional form, especially in clusters like this. And we can work reductively to clean this up as well. A couple of different ways of going about it. And we'll talk about that should we feel we need to. But here, continuously going back, grabbing more water so that we can get a nice sharp application. go. Nice and pretty. Grab a bit more. Very good. Bit quieter again, but you already know why. I like that a lot. I think that that works really well. Here, trying to connect the back area 
because all of our previous connective pieces were done with the darker pigment and of course we do now need the brighter option to bring it all together. A couple more connective. And this is something that you might want to paint from a bit farther away. Something I'd always advise if people feel like they're kind of doing the same thing too much or they do want to paint from a bit of a distance, hold your brush from back here. You can take additional steps back from the canvas and it lets you just get a wider perspective, but it also loosens your application style, which can be really, really beneficial. If again, you feel like you're kind of in a rut in terms of application and just doing things too similarly. It will make it harder to make applications, but that's kind of the point. It just shapes up the process. We do this a lot with figure drawing. But it definitely has good applications in painting. Some painters actually really advise not to hold the brush so close to the bristles, but I think it's really up to personal preference, what you feel comfortable with, and I personally find that I create the best paintings when I do both. So, again, really up to you. Don't ever feel like I, or any other painting instructor, by the way, should tell you, has the authority to tell you exactly what you should be doing all the time. I always want you to look at these lessons as a series of ideas, a series of things that you can implement should you want to. I give advice in these and I tell you how I go about it, but I never wanted to come off as this is the definitive way that you go about painting subject X. You know, have fun with it, make it your own, take artistic liberties. If you love painting in a certain way and I or someone else tells you, oh, you know, maybe, maybe do it this way, feel more than welcome to continue painting it in the way that you love, right? It's supposed to be fun and painting's great when you can add that individual charm and touch. So just friendly reminder, while I and a lot of others like to help assist with learning to paint and all of that, it's still something that's very subjective, very individual, and I don't ever want to take that away from you. So, we're just <laughs> a friendly reminder. I know we're on kind of a tangent, but everything I say is merely a suggestion in an attempt to help. It is not the definitive way, as I really don't feel there should be a definitive way. There are just too many different types of styles and paintings and It's good to explore and show that you are really having fun with the process because I think a lot of us paint to have fun, to relax. It's this cathartic act that helps us sort out our thoughts or escape them. And I just want this process to be exactly what you want it to be, right? It's also important to know that, you know, we all want different things out of our hobbies, and that's okay. Also, 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 I occasionally get asked the question if I'm okay with people selling their work based off of my acrylic lessons, and the answer is, yeah, please do. Any, any of these acrylic painting lessons that we work on here on the channel, you are more than welcome to sell your variants of it. I am here to help, and I would like to think that it's not only just teaching you how to paint, but also maybe helping you get some pieces started that you can sell and maybe, maybe make into a, a little business as well. So hopefully that clears up a, a couple of the questions I'll get in the comments. There we go. 
Now, for the next step, we are going to be using a slightly larger liner brush, though you are welcome to use the one you were using previously or just the corner of a one inch flat headed brush. But this is the one that I'm going to be using here, and here's a little size comparison. We're going to make sure that it's nice and damp. Then we'll create a darker green to be the base of our flowers, where it's kind of coming out of once we get to the top of the stem. So start with about an equal amount of our titanium white and our sap green. I double up my sap green because I do want it to be a bit more saturated. Then we'll add in some titanium white, brighten it up further, and we'll go in for a little test. I'll apply this to the areas that I know I'm going to want our flowers. And I think that's actually fairly nice. We'll do a couple more tests, and if we don't like it, it's very easy to cover up. But I'm essentially just painting little ovals that are on their side, slightly rotated here and there, looking predominantly for the ends of these. However, I am occasionally just applying them where I feel like there should be the top of a flower, again, using the reference photo. I like that. And I'll probably just start with not too many, but we'll go back, grab some more pigment, And I'm going to work on the base layer for all of them at once. So all three clusters, just to make my job a little bit easier in terms of blending and mixing. So here we are from a side view, just so you can get a couple of different angles. As you can see, I'm also going to work them into the background. There are going to be some larger clusters of flowers and there are going to be some individual little standalone pieces. It's important to vary that so that again things look nice and natural. A lot of the ones in the distance I'm going for more of a horizontal oval than I am a diagonal one, simply to make our visuals a little bit more concise and not over the top. We also want them to be smaller as you move into the background so my taps do get smaller and smaller. Applying less and less pressure every time where in the foreground, I'll apply quite a bit. And I might even go over some of our initial applications a couple of times just to build up those greens and make sure we have what we really want. There we go. So now that we have all of those applied and dry, I am going to stick with the same brush and we're going to grab a quite a bit of our cadmium yellow deep hue. Move that close to our previous yellow that we used for the grass. We'll grab an equal mixture of titanium white, mix up a really nice, thick, bright, but desaturated yellow. Then we'll add in the smallest tint of Mars Black, and I do mean the smallest tint. Again, 1 20th at the most, I think. And we'll go in and start painting our flowers. And our flowers are initially, very simply, just going to be much like our initial application, little ovals that are leaning in one direction or another. Going to try to leave the bottom portion to be still there so you can still see that little bit of green showing through, the area that's actually holding up the flower. And I can tell the sun <laughs> just went behind a cloud. One of those days where it's sunny and then it's cloudy and then it's sunny and then it's cloudy, and it used to frustrate me. And I, I talk about this in a lot of lessons because I think it's a really important lesson in general. But it used to frustrate me that I couldn't paint consistently with the same amount of light on days like this. And I love painting in fall. I think it's probably my favorite season to paint in. But there are so many days like this where it's just difficult to get consistent lighting naturally. And what I, I learned over the years is that it's actually a great thing because your painting isn't always going to be viewed on a sunny day. It's not always going to be viewed on a rainy day. It's going to be in a lot of different scenarios and seeing it in all of those lighting settings while you're creating it can be really great because you might want to make it to look better in one or the other or something that looks good in all of them and it just lets you kind of feel it out on days like today, where we don't have that opportunity 
when it is purely sunny or purely cloudy. So, if you're anything like me, and you uh, just got a little bit frustrated initially with uh, the lack of consistency on days like today, or when you're watching this and I can see in the, the monitor, it's very bright and right now, but you know, it, it'll probably get a little bit darker again. Recognize that it's, it's actually probably a good thing. Now I will try to monitor the camera settings as you move through the following steps, but I did think it was important to explain that and also to not edit this footage at all so that you can see it editing itself in real time. There we're getting to be a, a bit darker again in the sky. So I think it gives us a really natural look. But something else to consider while we go ahead and we paint the tops to all of these beautiful little flowers. Starting to come together. Still a lot to do. Still a lot to do, but it is starting to come together. Kind of kind of crazy how we've been painting for so long. We're still on this front area of grass. Though I do think it really goes to show that there are different types of grass and rendering grass isn't as simple as one technique generally. It's a combination of them and it's building highlights and layers and that's how we do the best job possible. The same goes for water or really any other subject. There isn't one way to paint much of anything because so many subjects change depending upon how close or far away they are from them visually and depending upon weather and just so many factors, so, so, so many. So, do keep that in mind when you're painting. I think once we realize that, our paintings as a whole get a whole lot better. These should, by the way, be getting a lot smaller as you move into the background, so I'm progressively making the ones in the foreground a lot larger. And we will be adding additional highlights and details to these too, so. Don't worry about that if they're looking too simple at this point. That is just part of the process. I'm also doing a couple of smaller ones here in the foreground just to show that there is size diversity and that the diversity doesn't only come from perspective. And then we'll do lots and lots of little taps as we move into the background here. Getting smaller and smaller, applying less and less pressure. It's adding a lot to the background that I think it really needed. And again, you can create little clusters here and there. So lots through there, but then we won't do too many down below it or to the sides of it. Again, very bright. <laughs> I will, uh, again, promise to be more mindful of the lighting in the room as we work on this semi-cloudy, semi-sunny day. Now, before we proceed to add a lot of detail or continue to build our highlights, I am going to do just a second layer over top the ones in the foreground once they are fully dry because yellow is inherently a very thin pigment, so you'll be able to see a lot of the greens and the darker pigments underneath. So it is, it is important that we do make sure that we go back, we do our due diligence, and we give them a good application as really will like really will make the piece look a lot more professional in the end we don't have to worry too much about the ones in the distance but you can if you see any larger ones or any notable spaces and it's also worth noting that while i like to use a damp brush for the majority of my paintings i might go into this portion very specifically without any additional water on the brush as that does thin the paint as well, and we already are working with a thin pigment. The titanium white does help to build it up, but there are a couple different things you can do to play with it. So, entirely up to you and where you are at comfort-wise. I think I actually want a much larger one right here. And now that I've added a new one, we'll probably have to let it dry and then go back, but that's okay. Make it nice and big. So now that all of that has some time to dry, we are going to grab more of our yellow 
This time though, in our mixture, we're going to double up on the titanium white, and this is going to desaturate the pigment a little bit, but it's going to make it brighter. It's going to make it a little bit more thick, which is great for applying highlights and just more prominent pigments. And we're going to go in a couple of different directions. You could add actual petals to this. You could do a myriad of little taps to add in interesting different levels of detail if you'd like. You can essentially just go to the top of them and then blend your way back downwards. So there are a lot of different options. I'm going to go for the tapping motion. Just create a lot of really tiny little markings. That said, I might want to switch to the smaller liner brush and I will get you closer for this. Now for this, again, we probably don't want to use a lot of water in our mixture. We can apply it to the ones in the foreground and in the background. I'm going to do both. I'm not going to apply it to every single little flower though. We want some to pop more than others and that can be either strategic or randomized so that you get something that looks natural. Realistically, a combination of the two is probably ideal, but that is something to consider throughout the process. I'm kind of jumping around right now as to not do too many in one area by accident and also so I can kind of simultaneously balance the applications as I make them throughout the piece. I definitely want a lot in the background as that is really going to be our only additional level of contrast that we can have there. There's a lot more we can do in the foreground if we decide to. As we progress through the painting we'll know more about that. But right now we're jumping around, heading to the tops, lots of little taps in the foreground, a singular one in the mid and background of the foreground. This is all still, by the way, considered our foreground, but we have a foreground to the foreground, a midground to the foreground, and a, and a background to the foreground, so just something else to consider. We will be talking about the true midground and the true background a little bit later in the lesson. But for now, I am referring to this is the midground and that is the background. Definitely want more, more of these little taps in the background. I think that's something that could really aid the piece. Lots of little clusters, but then also areas that are a lot more open and don't have them at all. I'm also not exclusively applying this over top of our previous applications. If I find an area that I think will look really nice with it, I don't hesitate to apply. And I do go over the larger ones numerous times. Slowly building it up, as again acrylics are inherently semi-transparent, as is especially yellow. This is also a technique which will probably be better <laughs> applying uh, with a bit of a distance for a lot of the more randomized backing areas. Maybe not so much the foreground, but certainly the background. And there we go. Creating a nice cluster through there. Maybe it peeks out over on this side of the tree, which we are yet to paint. Bit of an open area. So we will continue using the one inch flat headed brush because we have a quite a large strip to cover and this will do it. We'll start by grabbing some of our Mars black, move that over some of our darker greens. This is all dry so I don't have to worry about it. We'll grab about one third that in titanium white to brighten it up. We'll of course grab about one third that in our sap of green and we have something fairly dark. We'll go in for a little bit of a test and I think this will actually work really really well for this base layer. We'll build a lot on top of it. This will be brighter than what we have here 
but it'll work. Let's get a little bit closer. So here we are, a little bit closer. We're going to work our way around the base of our larger trees. I don't have to be perfect with it, and I'd rather slightly overlap them than not, but for the smaller ones in the background, we can cover up the entirety of those. We are applying very minimal amounts of pressure along our edges, and then once we have those edges done, we can just fill in the rest. There we go. I feel like I don't have enough water on my brush to get that edge or that edge. So we'll take a little break, grab some water, grab some additional pigment. As you can tell, the clouds in the sun are being very dramatic today, but that's okay. We're not really blending any color right now. With that, we do need to let this dry, give it a second layer, and then we can come back in and start brightening it up. Now, while we are going to be using the half inch brush, we do want to continue mixing with the one inch just because it's a better way of moving around paint. With that, I'm going to grab quite a lot of our cadmium yellow deep hue, move that to a clean spot on our palette. We'll grab about an equal mixture of our titanium white, create a nice thick yellow, and then we'll grab about one third that in our sap green, and this should render a nice bright green. We'll desaturate it with a hint of our Mars black, and that may make it a little bit too dark for our mid value. We'll just test it in here. Okay, not quite as bright as what we have, which is what we want, though I do think I'll add slightly more titanium white and Mars black just to desaturate it slightly more as we are working in the background. With that, once I have it appropriately grayed, we are going to switch our brush and get a little bit closer. So now we'll switch back to that half inch flat headed brush. As you can see, it's quite disheveled. We'll grab some pigment just on the tips of our bristles. We really don't want too much. And we're going to start tapping this in as lightly as we can. We are rotating our brush in the air in between each tap. And initially, we're going to leave some space between our different taps and our textures, but as our initial layer begins to dry, we'll move back over it to give us significantly more coverage. However, we're not doing it initially while the paint is still wet, because if we did, we'd start blending the paint together, and instead of getting all of these little speckled applications, we'd get these larger blobs of paint. And that really isn't the intent well, we want it to be fairly consistent. We definitely don't want it to end up looking flat. We want that texture. So, lots of taps, lots of rotations. We do a similar thing with our fan brush in terms of rotations. However, they're much more full here because we're not really changing the direction of the applied pigment like we would with the fan brush. So this is just going to give us a very uniform look that we can build on top of. There we go. Just finish off this side and we'll test to see if the middle is dry. Looks to be. And it's drying much, much more quickly than it normally would for two reasons. One, we did not dip our brush in any water because we wanted to keep the so it's nice and sharp. And two, because we have such a miniature, minuscule amount of paint on the brush that it just dries so much more quickly. So especially in the back, I'm going back over it again. You can slowly see us lose contrast as we cover that darker pigment almost in its entirety. And that is intentional. We can have slightly more as we move towards us, so we'll just let that paint dissipate as we move forward. And we're doing this because generally you'll get a lot more contrast in the foreground than you will the background. You have a lot more of that reflective light in the background, colors visually amalgamating there. 
as do the values of the lights and the darts. So we do try to keep the background, uh, the middle ground, much more simple, visually. I'm trying not to disturb this line all that much. However, if we do, it is okay. I think regardless, we are going to go back to touch up this edge and those highlights. There we go. So, I like that a lot. We can, yet again, build it up very slightly. Add just a little bit more titanium white to the mix. I'll mix on top of our previous pigment. That way I know we'll end up with something nice and close that's a little bit too saturated. So I'll add titanium white, which will desaturate it and brighten it simultaneously. Still a little saturated, so we'll add some Mars Black to work with the white, turn it into a gray in the mix. Now we have something that's darker than what we previously had, and that's not what we want, so we add more titanium white. It's getting brighter. Let's do it again. It's getting brighter. But now we need more yellow because we want the background to be a bit warmer. And we can go in for a test of this. You can see it in relation to our past color right there. So we'll put that down, pick this up. And I want the back of the tree line to be quite dark where the front is going to have a bit more light. We're going to have a set of trees right here which are going to create shadows through here. And that means the front isn't going to have those shadows because they're just not going to extend that far. So this is where I'm going to do my initial test of this brighter pigment. With the last applications, we were starting at the top and working our way down. Here, it will be the opposite. We are going to want to wait to apply this to a dry surface though, so do keep that in mind. Yeah, I think this is too bright for that backing area, but it's actually really nice to create the second layer of where our highlights are going to be. So I'm just taking a second, looking over at the reference photo. There are a lot more strong linear applications or markings or shadows through here, trees that are getting lost in the sun. I don't think I'm going to focus on that initially. <laughs> Howie, Howie agrees, I'm not sure if you heard him there, but he also fears we should simplify it upon our first pass. And, build up if we feel we need to, simply because we don't want to overdo it or create too much of a complicated visual in an area that we don't necessarily really need to keep the viewer's eye. So it might be an artistic simplification and liberty just to ensure attention stays where we want it to. With that, we'll build this up a little bit and while I like the application done with this brush, we do need to separate the larger clusters of grass a little bit. And I think our next highlight needs to be done with, yet again, the sharper fan brush. Now we're going to do our mix for the highlight here yet again with the one inch flat. We'll look at our palette for the lighter green-ish yellow that we applied here in the background, still have a bit of it. And we want this, but a little bit more desaturated. So I'll actually start with quite a lot of titanium white. We'll grab about an equal amount, perhaps slightly less of our yellow. Blend those two together thoroughly. We'll grab maybe one eighth that in our sap green. You can see I'm continuously taking that off. We still do want it to have a little bit of green, but really not too much. And how are we going to continue desaturating this? we're going to add some Mars Black. So again, it can work with the titanium white, make it a bit more of a grayed mix. As you can see, it's quite a bit more yellow than what we've previously used. We can do a little tap in here, just do a little check. I think that actually works really nicely. We can darken it slightly more though, just so we have room to continue to build it up should we want to. If we go in with something extremely bright from the beginning, then we're essentially locked into that and we just don't have 
much space to move. So we just darken it a little bit more, put that brush down, pick up our initial fan brush, grab a very minuscule amount, head in to the foreground, so essentially where these two connect, right above it, and we'll go in for our taps, rotating the brush all the way to the other side. When we do rotate, we can't kind of go in random directions like we did with the flat-headed brush, but we'll start with this, go back, grab more, build it up, and we're not going to go all the way. We are going to, again, consider the fact that there's going to be a line of trees here. It's going to cast a hard shadow. So we'll do that. There's going to be a tree here, which will create a longer shadow. So I'll use my brush diagonally, leaving that little darker area right there. And I think we'll probably do another one of those but we're going to change the angle a little bit. So we look at the sun, we say, okay, if there's a tree here, then the light goes down like this. If the sun's here and there's a tree here, then it goes like this. We continuously get more horizontal the farther out we get from our tree location. So we'll just fill a little bit of this in, leaving a slight bit of that darker backing area. Grab more of our pigment. Head to the closest point of this mid to background field. Start to move it up. And the tree line is going to get significantly larger as you move towards the right. So while these get a bit higher in our applications, I'm actually going to let this essentially taper off there. I'm not going to bring it up any higher and then it's going to move down like so, but a little bit more softly. We'll grab just a little bit more for over here. Now we're staying really close to our initial edge, and I'll do a slight line, find my sun, like that. So perhaps there's an opening in the trees that reveals a little bit of light, but not too much. There we go. Now we'll get a little bit closer and mix up something a little bit brighter. So yet again, starting with our titanium white, grab about an equal mixture of our cadmium yellow deep hue. As you can see, we already have a very stark difference between our previous pigment and this. We'll grab, last time it was about one eighth of our sap green. Let's aim for maybe one twelfth. Very, very minimal amount. And then we'll also grab maybe one twelfth of Mars black. So now we have something that can really pop. Recognize that this pigment isn't going to be this bright on the canvas, simply because again, acrylics are semi-transparent and would we'll give this a go. So, putting that brush down, picking up the previous fan brush, grabbing our desaturated but bright yellow, and we'll go in, creating some nice line work in the highlights exclusively. We are going to avoid this darker area, There we go. We want these to be sharp. And these are essentially going to be some of the more tall areas of grass that can just pick up a little bit more light as well as different clusters of our flowers. Again, this isn't meant to be an area that really steals a lot of attention. So it doesn't have to be incredibly detailed or stand out to a great degree, but I will grab a little bit more titanium white, work that in, and we'll just create some little patches of different flowers. There we go. With that, I think we should probably take a couple steps back 
and ensure we like where it is, like where it's going. Now, from a distance, I do think it looks good, but it can look better. So, this line right here is a little bit awkward because we essentially painted the mid or background on top of portions of the foreground where this should realistically overlap this. Now, we're going to do that, but if we were to just add the highlight that we have here right now, it would probably get lost within the greater highlight that we have. So we're going to start by reinstigating a little bit of a darker value, both into this and into this. Then once they're further defined as subjects, we can overlay the foreground yet again and create just a little bit more depth. With that, here I have my fan brush, and again, you don't have to blend with this. Normally I wouldn't, but I think because I'm going to be doing just small amounts, it'll be okay. With that, I do want a bit of a darker green, so I will grab some of my sap green here, probably about an equal mixture of our Mars black, just like that. It's a little bit harder to gauge how much you're grabbing when you're using the fan brush, but I just wanted to show you that it is achievable. We'll grab about maybe maybe one-fifth that in titanium white. Take off the majority of the paint, make sure that you still have a lot of really fine impressions on the brush. And we can create some slight separation in between different clusters of foliage. Just like this. If you do go about applying the extra depth and separation in the same way that I am here, Recognize that you'll probably have to go back in and add some added highlights on top, but we plan to do that anyway. That was part of the larger idea, so I think we're okay here. With that, we'll just add a little bit of that additional separation. Have that move up. Redefine this top space. And right now, it almost looks like it's a bit of an outline. We don't want that. <laughs> we will go back and fix it though. Now for the backing area, as we know, this is significantly more desaturated and even a bit brighter. We have more saturation and contrast in the foreground. So I'm grabbing some extra titanium white here, some extra Mars black, and we'll do a little test in this background area. I think that looked actually really good. And we'll just do a little bit of separation. This is going to be significantly less than what we had through that full backing area. There we go. And you can even soften it with your finger if you feel the need. But I think that worked great. There is very evidently two different areas of land. We have this and then it's a bit of a hill and then we lose the bottom and then we see the second portion in the background. With that, I'm breaking my rule. I'm actually washing this brush off. And generally we don't want to put this brush in water because we want the tips of it to be very sharp. But I am going to dry it off before next application. And with that, we do need to let this dry. So I'm going to clean my brush, dry it, we'll get a little bit closer and continue adding on that detail. So here we are a little bit closer and all of these darker new impressions really are quite noticeable. So we need to overlap them with some highlights so that they look like darker inner portions, right? Spaces that the light can't really hit. We will be sticking with our fan brush for the most of this. And we're going to want something that's more saturated than what we have back here and probably a little bit more green. So I will continue mixing with this brush. We'll grab our sap green to begin with. Grab probably almost an equal amount with our yellow, but not quite. Green being much stronger, we did remain in that general zone. We'll grab about an equal amount of our titanium white, just like that. And we'll grab a little bit of Mars black because we do still need to desaturate it. While it is in the foreground, we still don't go for hyper-saturated pigments. And as you can see, it's a little bit brighter than what we previously had, so we are building up in the right way. I'm not going to do too much of this, just enough to start that relayering process, but I might also apply it throughout a little bit, just to make sure things are nice and cohesive. Now, 
we'll double up the amount of our cadmium yellow. So about an equal amount to our current pigment on the palette. Grab an equal amount of our titanium white. Slowly building up. There we go. And again, doing a bit more of a spread just to ensure that we have it all working together. We're predominantly working in the back, by the way. So in the foreground, remember, we do more of the linear strokes. We are avoiding that because we're just trying to fix that transition. Here yet again, I doubled up my yellow and we'll add a hint of our titanium white. Make sure that our brush still has a lot of sharp impressions. There we go. Now we're really building up to a good color for the occasion. It's not quite there, but we are getting closer every time. Doing a little bit of a tap down here just to make it work. Double up our yellow, double up our white. Very slow process, but this is what's going to get us the best results. Now, if you feel like you're working too much wet paint on wet paint, do take a little bit of a break. And don't forget to take a couple of steps back mid process, just to ensure that it's all working the way that you want and that this area does still fit within the larger context of the rest of the painting. I feel like things are getting a little bit more saturated. So I'm going to work a little bit of it down here and I might even do some of those longer strokes. There we go. Now, as we do take those steps back, I realize that I love it. I think it's working significantly better now that we did go back in and re-add in those darker areas, but then also those lighter layers, I mean, many, many layers of those lighter layers. With that, we are going to add in some additional flowers, so I'm heading back to the smaller liner brush, making sure it's nice and damp. We'll grab our titanium white, work that into what we were just working with, probably add in some extra cadmium yellow, just build something that's noticeably brighter than what we had, and preferentially, probably a little bit more yellow. And then we can just re-interject little areas of flowers. Paint them in individually. We can use the fan brush for this sort of thing, but I do like the added level of control when we are just working on additional little details, not necessarily applications that are intended to fully form our subjects or the landscape in which they reside. So, just being a bit more selective. Re-adding in some in the middle area of our foreground, as that was reworked a couple of times, and trying to keep them relatively sharp. That said, I don't want to do too many, and we can always go back and apply more later, so quite happy with that, and our next step is going to be working on the sky, because we need to layer all of our trees on top of it. So, we are going to clean our water, our brushes, everything we can, <laughs> that way we don't dilute the pigments in our sky with what we currently have. So that is the next step. And through this, I'd also like to remind you to have a drink of water, have a little bit of food, have a snack. It's easy to get really invested in the painting process and just kind of forget these things. I know I personally do. So friendly reminder, take care of yourself, your health. And with that, we will jump back into the lesson. Now, for the sky, we are going to be using a little bit of Naples yellow, which is essentially a warm but very desaturated yellow. It's also quite a bit thicker than what you'll normally use, so it's great for rendering these softer golden skies. 
With that, I am going to be going in with the very clean one inch flat headed brush. My water is clean and we're going to be working on a clean area of our palette. With that, we're going to start with a lot of titanium white. I'll move this down here just because uh, while this is all seemingly dry, I really don't want to take the chance. Then I'll grab about one third, maybe one fourth that in our titanium white or in our uh, Naples yellow rather, mix that with our titanium white, get something really nice. Then we'll slowly add a little bit more until we get a good golden color, but something that is still going to be the brightest point in our sky. And therefore, we don't want to add too, too much. The more we add, the more we make it gold, but of course, the more we darken it. So I'll just continue to mix all of that together. And I think the biggest lesson here is just that I'm not going with the first pigment we mix. I am continuing until we get what we actually want. And it's just a slow progression. Yours may be different than mine. You can also test it directly on your reference photo. But there we have something that I think I'm quite happy with. If I don't love it in the end, we can always go back and add another layer. But with that, I'm going to start applying that right here at the base of my sky and where the sun is going to be. Now, upon initial application, I can already tell it's far from as bright as I want it to be. So I'm actually going to take the pigment off of my brush right now. I'm going to grab a lot of titanium white and I'll try to mix that in see if we can brighten it to the point that I'm happy and just like that we found our fix. So really nice when that works. Alternatively, we could have gotten a painting cloth or a little bit of paper towel, wiped it off the canvas and then brightened it from there. I am going to be working around some of my tree branches, but you definitely don't have to. You are more than welcome to cover them up and then just go ahead and redraw them. Again, I'm going to have trees at the bottom here. So I don't have to worry too, too much about this line, but I do want to keep the general motion. And I'm also pressing very softly with my brush to ensure that I don't have too hard of a stroke. With that, we'll continue to work over onto the sides. And I'm going to cover up the smaller branches that we have there. Uh, additionally, I'll cover up this smaller tree redraw that back in and we'll just move on upwards. Now we did add a lot of titanium white to the actual pigment. So we're going to have to add that down into this now. And as I get farther away from the center and where our sun is going to be, I want it to get a little bit darker, but also a little bit more gray. So I'm going to start an application in the next open area let that be, it'll be wet. Hopefully we get back to it while it is still wet, but if not, we can use a little bit of water just to help the blending process. But with that, I'm going to grab a hint of Mars Black, and I do mean a hint. I'm going to take off the majority of it. It's maybe 1 25th, <laughs> an equivalent to what we currently have on the palette. And even though it was so minimal, it was definitely powerful. So with that, I'll start applying it a little bit above where we were. And you know what? I'll get you a little bit closer for the application and our blending. So as we continue to get a little bit higher here, I'm going to start a new mix. So titanium white, hint of that yellow, not much at all. Move that back just so you can get a, a better view of how minute it is. And we'll grab again a very small amount of Mars Black, wiping off the excess. And then we'll slowly blend into it, giving us a nice warmer gray, just like that, which we can then apply to the top. Recognize that the majority of this sky is going to be covered by foliage and additional branches that we are yet to draw in or apply. So we're going to get a color that I don't think is traditionally loved. I, I don't think if you were to leave the sky 
just <laughs> void of anything else, that this is a color you choose and you end up really appreciating. But it's intentionally subtle. And hopefully, because of that fact, it'll make everything else look really, really nice and it'll complement things without being overwhelming, though the middle area will still be that nice gold. And that's the area that we'll predominantly see. So right now I'm just going over a lot of this very softly with my brush. I might not have to do a second layer. I, I used quite a lot of thick paint and not a lot of water. But if you find that your pigments are thin, then you definitely want to let it dry and then go back in. With that, I did miss a little, little spot at the bottom. So we'll grab some of that and we'll just work it in. Using the corners of this brush is great around our tree limbs working with real detail. So I did decide to go back and add a second layer up there really because A, I do think it's going to make it look more professional for the majority of people, but also because I always talk about it. I'm always kind of preaching this idea that add more layers it will look better. And I strongly feel that it does look better now that I went ahead and did it. I think we could have gotten away with one, but I think two makes a difference. So I like that. It's very simple. You have this slight uh, change of warmth from this up into the top. Great. So now we're going to start working on the tree line, which separates the grass and this, because right now we just have this really awkward edge, right? Now I am going to be working with the filbert brush and we'll do a, you know, a much more clean, sharp look at that brush, but I essentially like it because it has a nice sharp tip to incorporate detail, but the edges are rounded so it can be good for blending. It also carries a decent amount of paint, so very, very versatile uh, tool. With that, I'm going to dip the bottom third of it in a little bit of water, just as we normally do. I'll head over to my palette and we're going to make more of a greenish gold for the first applications of our distant trees. So I'm going to start with the color that is closest to gold, that being our Naples yellow. I'll grab maybe one fifth that in our sap green, just because the sap green is going to be a lot stronger. We'll blend those two together, grab a little bit of titanium white to brighten it up. And with that, I think we'll head in for our first attempted application. It's going to be right in the background here. And already, I think that looks far too saturated for what I'm going for. I'll do a little test on the reference photo. And yeah, that, <laughs> that definitely needs to be toned down. We'll grab some Mars Black. Work that in the mix. It definitely darkened it significantly, so we'll add Titanium White to Brighten it back up. And now we have a very desaturated variant of what we initially had there. Now if I apply this onto what we have, I'm not going to get what we have on the palette. It'll be a mix. If I wanted it to completely replace it, I'd wait for this to dry and go in with a very thick application. But I think we can get away with just applying it on top. So we'll give that a go. There we are. Bring that up over here, have it come back down, do some tapping motions around the top of the back to imply trees, and then we can fill that in. Once I have that applied, I'm going to take a step back, and I love that color. I think that's perfect. So. Now we'll continue with a couple of trees for the distance, and they're going to be done with that same tapping motion. I'm rotating my brush in between taps, and we'll have it get lost right around here where the sun is, so it really dissipates. We run out of paint. That is ideal. Then we'll grab more paint. We'll start over on the right-hand side, We'll start with more taps and we'll let it run out as we get towards this middle section again. Applying less and less pressure so that I do run out, or at least if I don't run out, I'm not applying as much pigment. That's good. Grab a little bit more water. 
grab our paint, fill in this bottom area, do some little taps over it to ensure that it has the same application consistency as everything else that we've been working on. Add some extra little taps through there. And this is just the first line of trees. We are going to be a, doing a darker one and we'll be doing that actually right now. So now we'll grab some of our sap green. We'll work right beside our initial color just so we have a good point of reference. We'll warm it up with about an equal mixture of that Naples yellow, but it's not really going to do too much other than brighten it because again, sap green's just a lot stronger. We'll then grab about half that in Mars black. This will really darken it. Now we need to make it a bit more desaturated. So I'll grab a half that in titanium white, which will brighten it, but also desaturate it. And we'll go in for a test. Realistically, I actually want something slightly darker than what we have in the background here. So we're going to need to double up on our Mars black. And that's because I want it to have contrast and stand out from what we're doing here. Just double checking on the reference photo, and I like it. So, we'll go in with our tapping effect, overlapping a lot of those trees that we have in the background. We're going to do a sharper line at the bottom, and we're doing so purposefully to show that there's another hill, another drop, more trees. Also, if we have more of a rough and jagged edge at the bottom, it's going to simply imply that we're still seeing detail within that level of grass and it's just far too far away to realistically assume that we would see that. So we simplify it for realism's sake. That said, let me get you a bit closer. So here we are. We're going to continue towards the right hand side of the canvas and you can go in for a tap at the top if you'd like, but realistically when you have brand new paint, you're probably going to want to do your sharper line work first. So I'm going to go in at the bottom and just ensure that we have that nice clean line that separates our background area from the really distant background. And then I can go back into the top section and do my tapping. There we are. We'll have some portions that are a little bit higher than others. Peaks and valleys as there will be land that is higher. Just like that. Grab a bit more, start with the, again, sharper bottom, have it connect, and then I'm going to have it expand, but not to such a great degree. I do want to not mirror both sides, I want them to feel unique to a point. And I feel like that might actually be a little bit too dark. So we're just going to grab a little bit of titanium white, work that into our previous mixture. There we go. Not quite as bright as what we have down below, but not as dark as it was, and I think a very happy medium. There we are. So here we have a little bit of a more distant look and I think the farther away we get from it, the more natural it's going to be. Again, paintings are really meant to be viewed from, you know, five, ten, maybe more feet away in a room rather than a couple inches from the canvas. But with that, while we may go back to this area to reinstigate additional details or highlights, at this point, I'd like to start moving up into our trees. We have two large ones. We have three smaller ones. I've gone ahead and redrawn them onto the canvas and we're going to be applying them with a couple of different brushes. Now, for the trees, I'm going to start with a filbert brush to fill them in because it has a good amount of size to work in this larger area, but that nice sharp tip will be great for the longer branches. That said, it is damp and the bristles are separating a little bit because of that. However, as I add more paint, it should condense and create something more uniform. That said, in regards to adding paint, we're going to start with Mars Black as we want the initial application here to be quite dark, almost silhouetted. So we'll begin by mixing up that pigment. The greens here on the palette are all fully dry, so I don't have to worry about that. And I am going to mix a larger amount, so we'll grab quite a bit of black, 
we'll grab about one fourth that titanium white to brighten it up slightly. We don't want it to be darker than the bottom portion of our grass. And then I'm also going to grab about one fifth that of our Naples yellow. And this is essentially going to be to warm our pigment up just a little bit and allow it to share color with the rest of the painting. Now I have a lot of pigment here on my brush and if I'm really careful, I can apply it to the center of our tree here, but I really don't want to do much more with it. So we're going to take that extra paint and wipe it off on here. Then we'll wipe off the remaining excess on some paper towel or painting cloth. Make sure our brush is nice and damp so we can get a bit more of an accurate application. Go back, grab a minimal amount of paint. And now we can start by working on our edges. I'm going to try to angle this so that you can still see quite well. That should work. Remember, we do like to work on our edges first because they are generally the hardest area to get once you start to run out of paint. We'll just swap sides. I'm not making a singular line down. I like to make multiple little tap and runs with this. And I do that very specifically so that the tree has additional character. Often if you go top to bottom, one stroke, it just looks a little cartoony. So this is an easy way to add some extra realism to the piece. Now the bottom is going to look a little bit awkward. We're going to do a bit of a tapping motion so that it looks like the grass is moving up on top of it, but we are going to go back later and add some extra flowers and things at the bottom to just clean that up. Then when I'm almost out of paint, I go into the middle and just fill those areas in nice and easy. Let's grab some extra water, wipe off the excess, grab some extra paint. I'm going to take my pinky finger, ground it on the canvas to eliminate shake from my hand. And I'll work on the top edge of this branch, applying very little pressure because the more pressure we add, the more the bristles will expand and we really don't want a large application here. I'm going to try to position my arm again, not to uh, cover your sight lines. Makes it a little bit more difficult to paint, but it's not necessarily an awful thing because when we make it harder to paint, often we deviate from our natural application patterns and we create something a little bit more interesting. It's why we sometimes paint from farther away, as we talked about. So that's a really interesting movement. I might be able to work on a little bit of this branch, but it definitely gets too small really quickly. So I'll just connect it there and we'll come back with a different brush. With that, more paint. Really like the movement to this larger branch up here. Again, just working within the drawn lines that I have, I used woodless colored pencils because they don't generally dilute pigment. So it's very safe and you can use different colors to allocate different subjects, obviously. That's a, a bit of a brown, which works well here. And if you are just painting away and you find that you're struggling with the drawing or the shapes, remember you can find the traceable to help with the drawing process up over on Patreon along with the reference photo, which can help you color match throughout the process as I was doing earlier. This is a community funded channel. Uh, Patreon is how we fund it. And so it's a great way to, uh, to say thank you and support what we're doing here while also getting some pretty useful benefits. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to everybody who is up there. I do this in every episode and I will continue for every episode because honestly it means a lot and I wouldn't be here doing this without you. So big thank you to everybody who does support the channel directly. 
making longer lessons like this is always pretty risky on YouTube because if they don't do well and they don't get many views then it's just not something that's sustainable but because of you we can take those risks make these much longer much more in-depth lessons and this is definitely what I'm passionate about so thank you for providing uh, me and all of us with the opportunity to do these again really couldn't take that risk and do that without you otherwise it might have to be those um, you know three minute little videos where it's a speed painting and you know those those typically do get really good views and therefore can be financially rewarding but I do like talking about the process and walking you through all of it and by the way that's not meant to be a, uh, a knock on those videos or the people who make those videos I think that they can be really inspiring and lovely and also informative. It's just not not the content I personally want to make here. And uh, I'm very appreciative of the fact that, again, because of everybody, we're able to take the time to make these lessons the way that we do. Fun fact, this is not the first time I've <laughs> painted or taught this lesson. It's not the first canvas I've worked on. I um, was doing another one and then I realized, oh, you know what? I could do this a lot better if I just changed that technique and that meant redoing it. But again, I was able to take that time and really do it right because of your support. So thank you <laughs> again. Uh, it also means that I'm, uh, I'm able to only put out lessons I'm very proud of. And that also means a lot, I think, in terms of work fulfillment and also just ensuring that you don't ever get a lesson that perhaps teaches something the wrong way because I can always go back and redo it if I see a better way of going about it. Much like what I ended up doing here with this lesson. It means it uh, took a little bit longer to get out but I think it's a lot better for it. So uh, getting back to the uh, the larger point. Thank you to everybody who really does support the channel. And I, I know I say it in every every lesson and it's probably a little bit annoying for those of you who watch all of them, but I think it's really important. So, big thank you. And of, of course, by the way, this is also important because whenever I say this, I know I, I get comments saying, oh, I, I want to, and but I can't, and people feeling guilty about it. If you can't, don't feel guilty, it's okay. We, again, have a really great, strong community that does keep this going. And if you're here enjoying, you know, I'm, I'm just happy to have you. I'm happy to have you just be a part of the community. So it's okay. And don't ever, don't ever feel guilty about that. You know, we all, we all go through different points in our life where we can, you know, kind of spend some extra money and support what we, uh, what we enjoy. And sometimes we can't. And I think that's, that's entirely understandable, entirely reasonable, especially in times like these. So no one, <laughs> no one's allowed to feel guilty if they can't, but if you can, and again, you want the, the traceables, the reference photos, uh, all five of my eBooks, one of which uh, well, uh, three, four of which full of traceables, three of which, uh, the other one acrylics for beginners, which is essentially just the essentials, everything you need to know about acrylic paints, um, and access to our exclusive Facebook group. If you're interested in any of that, you can sign up to Patreon on the avail link in the description. But again, if you're not, or you can't, no worries either. But big thank you to everybody who does because these lessons could not happen if it wasn't for you. By the way, we switched to the liner brush. <laughs> we did this a little while ago uh, just because it's, it's a lot smaller. It's giving me a lot more control. And it's allowing us to accomplish our goals significantly more safely. I'm cleaning up some of the edges that were slightly rough because the filbert brush just wasn't able to make that sharp marking. 
doing multiple layers because we do want to make sure it's nice and thick just like everything else there we go and we'll start moving over to this side applying very minimal amounts of pressure we're not painting all of the branches by the way we don't have to because we are going to be painting foliage and said foliage is going to cover a lot of the branches. We're also going to be painting branches on top of the foliage. So there are quite a few steps to be made. And it's not, not something we have to worry about too much right now. Started to run out of paint there, so I got a very unfinished line. That said, I think I'm going to move the camera just so you have a bit of a better view as you move towards the left-hand side here of the painting. Now, I know I noted that we were going to start moving towards the left, but as I did, I stepped back for a second and I realized this tree isn't <laughs> where it's meant to be. At least the base of it isn't. What we're meant to do is bring this all the way down here and this is an excellent example of why I always talk about the need to take steps back. The fact that when we're really close to the canvas, we can say, oh, that looks really good. That's working. I like that a lot. And then we don't connect it properly to the rest of the painting. Very much something that happened here. Because this tree is quite large. If it were in this back field, it would look much smaller, like what we're going to have here or here, and I'm circling the entirety of what those trees are going to be. So, we're going back to the filbert brush. We are filling in the base of this tree, just like so. You can use the liner brush along the edges if you really want to clean it up. We'll do a bit of a tap at the bottom, but of course we are still going to Go back over it with some flowers and some added grass. Just friendly reminder, <laughs> do take those steps back. Here is a very, very evident example of why that's necessary. With that, because we did so, I think, just to make things look a little bit more natural, I'll switch to my liner brush. And while I really like this, I'm just going to expand it, make it look a little bit bigger. That way we have a progression where the branches get smaller as we move on upwards. And it's just a little bit more dramatic now. I think it works really well. So, quick fix, nothing uh, too difficult there, but just a, uh, a reminder to take their steps back. With that, we are now going to start moving into the left-hand side of the canvas. So, much like our previous tree, this one is also not going to land in that back field, but rather one in the foreground. So I'm just going to start with our liner brush here, bring that down, and my application is quite rough here. I don't have a lot of water or pigment on the brush because it is a significantly smaller brush, but we can go back, clean up those edges. I just wanted to get the correct spacing in, and then once we have those edges down, we can work our way into the middle. And I'm working with this brush because this tree is just smaller physically. It's slightly farther away than the other one, but we're painting it with this brush because it is just physically smaller. So we're going to start with that nice little base there. We will work our way up like so. Again, not making long individual strokes, but rather amalgamations of them. There we are. Really, really love this process. It's cathartic, it's something that you really get into a flow of. One of our next branches is going to start right down here, work its way up. And I can tell in the reference photo, it actually ends up meeting this one. But I think we're going to take an artistic liberty, and we'll just have it dodge it a little bit. 
so they almost meet. It's a really neat visual area, something you kind of have to do a second take of. And you question if it's the same branch or different ones. So that worked well. We'll do another larger branch coming off of this. So we'll have two right here. We'll finish this elongated one. Like so. And I think we're starting to expand quite high and in different ways. We should probably take a little bit of a step back before we really continue. Now we are almost done here with the larger tree. So I'm just going to fill out a couple of our remaining branches and then we can start working on the smaller ones that we have right here, here, and here. For those, I'm going to start working with a smaller liner brush, though you are more than welcome to continue with the one you have if you feel you can deliver an adequate amount of detail. This one I think actually can create the right amount of detail, it's just that it'll be easier with a smaller brush. So I will be switching that up once I'm done touching this area up. and. The top of this tree is going to look a little bit awkward. We're going to add a lot of foliage here. The majority of it is going to be covered, so I'm not too concerned about it. But even in the reference photo, it's almost not really recognizable as to where some of these branches end up going. So I'm just kind of taking some artistic liberties, figuring out what, what feels like it would be natural, and we're going to cover the majority of it up. So if there is an area of your branches that you don't particularly love. Don't worry about it. There are going to be opportunities to ensure that it doesn't hinder the final painting. With that, we'll do another little branch here. I have quite a bit of water on my brush right now, so I'm getting some very thin applications. It does mean we'll have to go back and do a second layer, but again, that's always a good idea regardless. And the additional water that I'm using on my brush is really there in large part just to help me get a nice, sharp, consistent application. There we go. Tie this around. Maybe make it quite a bit bigger because it is towards the bottom. Something else you want to do when we're creating our trees is always look at the insert points on the left and right hand side and try to stagger them so that they're not directly across from each other. Here, this one you can see inserts here, which is more so in the middle of this. The highest point is above this one. This kind of sits in the middle here and then down below. So do just try to keep that little type of thing in mind. It will make the painting better. It's a small thing, but it does make a difference. So I like I like the big trees. Again, we'll cover up most of that one. Let's get a little bit closer and start working on the smaller ones. Now, while I do want to work with a slightly smaller liner brush for these, I am going to use the current brush very specifically for the bottom mid portion of our tree because it's essentially the correct size by itself and it'll just make our life easier. So I guess I will continue using this for the larger portions of the branches. Not all of them, but the ones that are more prominent. We're going in with very, very little pressure. You can see just how small those strikes can get when we intend for them to be quite tiny. That one's quite semi-transparent. And the semi-transparent layers, while not great up in the larger trees, aren't actually a bad thing here. Very specifically, because it makes it look like more light is wrapping around the subject, and it's kind of being consumed by this distant light, which does actually give us additional depth for really no extra work. We could have changed the pigment to be a little bit warmer, to be a bit more like the sky, and that is something that would have made the painting look better, but we actually didn't have to because simply by working with water, we were able to eliminate that step and just make it a little bit easier on ourselves. There I'm 
interjecting uh, a little bit of movement on top of another tree. Again, very important, something we do want to keep in mind throughout this process. Grab some extra paint there for the larger body of that branch. Do a second layer down here. Now I'm going to take some of that paint off, and I know I know I said I was going to switch to the other brush, and I probably still will, but this is just working really well right now. We're not going to do too, too many branches. You're only going to see the larger ones from a distance. So we're just trying to find a good balance, something that looks natural but not overdone. And I think that's about the smallest my brush will let me make a stroke. So, I think we'll finish off with this and we'll head over to the one on the left where we'll grab a significantly more paint because the brush is very watery. Fill in this bottom area. And again, much like the inserts in trees, you do want to look at the ground and say, okay, are these at the exact same point horizontally, this one is going to be a little bit farther down. And even if it is almost the same in the reference photo, I would take an artistic liberty and change it just because you can make it look a lot better, a lot more interesting by working with those liberties. So we're going to do the larger branches while we have this paint. Normally the larger branches are a little bit closer to the bottom and then you have the actual trunk of the tree, right? There we go. Those two look like they connect to the same spot, which is a nice way of showing that there are branches A that space out quickly from the trunk, but also that maybe one of these is in front of the tree, one of them is behind, and therefore they just visually look that close. Again, another way of kind of cheating depth a little bit. There we go. Applying as little pressure as possible. Going to have a lot of foliage in this, so I don't have to worry too much about how high these end up going or how elaborate they are, as a lot of them will be covered. But we're going to do our best to make it look natural. As we do still have to do a couple more of these. And we want to be in good practice anyway. Now some trees can be significantly more developed than others. Important thing to consider. And I just don't feel like I'm getting the amount of detail that I want with this brush anymore. So I'm going to put that down and we'll grab a slightly smaller liner brush. See that? When we make it wet, it will of course get even smaller. The bristles will condense and now I'll have even more control. Yeah, already, just like that. Nice and easy. Of course you want this to fit and feel natural with the rest of the painting, so I will go back and just add some sharper ends, little pieces to that which we've already established over here. I think we need something to cross over with this larger branch. Not in the reference photo, but artistic liberties are our friends in a lot of scenarios. Once you have the basics built up. We just will try to not overdo it. There we go. Okay, I like that a lot. It's not too much detail, it's not too little detail. If we want more, we can go back and add it. But for now, 
I'm happy. Now we're going to move over to the right hand side of the canvas as we do have another tree. This one's a bit closer than both of these. So we need to ensure that the bottom of it is farther down than both of these because it's closer to us. And I am back to the larger liner brush as you can see because we do need to cover a bit more surface area as it is closer. Still have quite a bit of water so you can see just how transparent that is. And we'll remix some pigments. So grab quite a lot of our Mars Black, Naples Yellow for warmth and a little bit of hue, Titanium White, and that should do a good job. I have a lot of paint on my brush, so I'm only going to do the extremely large areas in this tree because realistically, I don't have that much leeway for details right now. Another one coming right down there. Good. Okay, take that excess paint off my brush. We'll continue using this one for a little while and switch over to the other, should we need it. Again, I think I'll deviate a little bit from the reference photo here just so that we can get something a little bit different that fits well within the context of our painting, but still looking at it for the general ideas. Still trying to make the branches smaller and smaller as we work our way up into the painting. There we go. This one is closer, so I'm doing more small branches than I did with the previous ones. And as you can tell, I'm also working a little bit more quickly, simply because we've had a lot of practice. And when the trees are larger, you have more leeway to make decisions and applications. There's more of a freedom because each stroke matters a little bit less. You should always be aware and cognizant of what you're doing, why you're doing it, but realistically, the more strokes you have, the more applications, the more branches have the tendency to get lost within the mix and just naturally fit, right? Because you end up looking at it more as a whole and you don't necessarily recognize the smaller, potentially more unnatural looking pieces that you do have to be really careful of repetition, especially if you're applying it significantly more quickly than you normally would. Looking to do another intersecting piece, maybe like that. Yeah, I like that, I like that a lot. Okay. You know what? I don't know that we'll have to use the smaller one. We have a lot of control here, which is nice. Again, we'll have a lot of foliage through here, so it's not too big of a deal, but if we want to go back and add detail, we can do it. Though, I'm quite happy with that as it is. So, time to move to our next step. Now the next step is actually something we've done before in part. We included all of this darker shadow here in the background and we did a lot of it with our fan brush. We're going to go back to this and we're going to incorporate more shadows, however this time they are going to be for the tree. So we're going to designate where our sun is very specifically. We kind of did so before when we were crafting the lines for the tree line, but we're going to do it for the individual trees and we're going to ensure that they also have shadows and create a bit more depth within the painting. So I have my fan brush. I'm going to grab some of our sap green. We'll just move that right down here. Grab maybe a third of that to start in Mars Black, a third of that to start in Titanium White. Let's double up our Titanium White to desaturate it. Let's double up our Mars Black to darken it, but also further desaturate it. We'll go in for a little test in the background. Still far too dark. Yet again, double up Titanium White. Go in for a little test. It's actually very, very close, but it's a little bit too saturated. So, yet again, more Mars Black, knowing that we'll make it darker than we need to. More Titanium White 
to balance out the Mars black and further take away that real green and that, that is much better. So if the sun is right here, we need to essentially put our brush on an angle where say the top of it would touch the sun and then we find the bottom of our tree and whatever that line is, is where the shadow is created. Like that. So here, and then we will have it for the larger trees. I have to do a bit of an extension. You can use a ruler or something of that nature if you find that useful. In the foreground, we will have to go to a bit of a darker pigment just because we do increase the contrast as you move forward. So we'll just grab some extra Mars black. There we go. Much better. It also makes the base of the tree look a lot more natural. So, easy fix, easy additional depth, and with that, I'm actually looking at the amount of shadow that we have in the background. I feel like our backing tree line needs to be a bit higher. So we can go back and use the fan brush. No, <laughs> sorry, the filbert brush, which is what we previously used. Or alternatively, we can try using the fan brush. That's what I'm going to do right here. It'll overlap our tree above there just a little bit, but we can always go back and fix that. Little pieces sticking out around the top. Nice little added detail. There we go. Definitely think that helped. think that helped a lot, actually. I'm going to bring a little bit of the shadow down. So, we do have to remember to go back and just ensure that our trees are nice and dark and that they don't have too much green on them, but we can do that a little bit later. It is time for the next step. Now for our next step, we're going to be using some burnt sienna for the very first time in this lesson. Mine is by Winsor & Newton and it's just a really nice warm earthy value that'll look great for foliage with the warmer light touching it. That said, I'm also going to be using a softer fan brush for the very first time. We have been using a much more stiff one where the bristles are much more noticeable and individual, but here they're much more condensed and when this has water on it, as I will show you right now, the bristles tend to clump together. So you have significantly less markings that it will make and will be able to render individual leaves and larger clusters of them very simply. But before we really dive into that, we do need to mix our color. So we are going to be mixing with, of course, our one inch flat headed brush. And we're going to start here with quite a bit of our burnt sienna. We want to begin in a clean spot on our palette. So I will work over here as this has been dry for a long time. I'm going to grab about an equal mixture of our Naples yellow because it's a much more thick pigment. And as you can see, we have this really beautiful warm orange. We're going to interject maybe one fifteenth that in our Mars black. Just to begin, we don't want anything excessively bright. And we'll grab a hint of our titanium white as well. So just like that, really nice pigment. I'll put our brush down though I'm probably not going to take the pigment off right now because realistically we will be going back to mix more. I'll grab my fan brush, make sure it is damp so that my bristles are spread out. We'll grab this pigment on both sides and then we'll look for an area that doesn't matter that much. This is our very first application. We want to ensure that we are being smart and safe with it, give us a little time to warm up. And this is going to be predominantly for the bottom area and the edges that receive more light 
in our foliage. So this is an area that's going to get a lot of light because it's close to the sun, but also it's going to get a lot of foliage because this area is just naturally very covered. So I'm going to go in with a lot of little taps, just like so. I'm rotating my brush. As you can see, we are covering quite a lot of our tree branches and whatnot. Here we are, going towards the end. You can even be very intentional with your mark making because the bristles are well spread out and distinctive, right? Unlike the other brush, you do have more control here and we do intend to use that control. So we'll head over to this other one now that we have some practice. I really liked our first application. I'm going to try to avoid this larger branch, but it doesn't really matter too much. We can always go back and just add additional paint should we need to. Much like our other applications, as we continue to make our marks, we run out of paint and our marks, because the brush is damp, get semi-transparent. So it's at that point that I start to move over into this middle section where we inherently are going to have a lot brighter pigment because there's going to be more light moving through that area of foliage. So lots of little taps once there's almost no paint left along these edges. Looking really nice. It's a good base layer. We do need to add and build a lot to it, but it's definitely how we want to begin. Now we'll head up here. We'll be making larger marks. So added pressure in the brush because we are getting closer to us and working on trees that are closer. I'm looking up at the reference photo just to figure out where my taps are going to be, but in general, you are looking to make larger clusters that work in context with other ones. We are going to also be careful to not overdo this pigment too, too much. This is really meant to be for the brighter portions of the painting. And we are going to move past that area once we have the majority of the edges filled out. So, so far so good. Here, slightly avoiding some of the branches, but not entirely. Going over previous applications, making them thicker, making the clusters of foliage look more dense and therefore more full of leaves. So additional depth, very easy way of going about it. I know you've been very far away from a quite some time. You probably want me to zoom in. But I think this is a process where, for the most part, it's best to see from a distance, at least in the initial stages. There are going to be areas where we touch things up and we get a lot closer, but right now I think it is best that the camera does remain a bit farther back. I'm painting from a bit more of a distance, personally, so that I can see how it all flows together. So do recognize that this is intentional and I'm not trying to keep you away from the detail. It's just that this is really how we're going to get the best results together. Here we can apply, I'm not sure if you can hear that, my cat is sneezing in the background. It's very adorable. We're going to apply some highlights to this tree in the background and we'll just splash in a couple of these, not too many, these splash pieces, the ones that don't necessarily consume uh, an area or become a, a full cluster, these ones that are more semi-transparent and spread out, are more so just going to be showing through additional applications that we make later on to show that the foliage that's on this side, the side that's closest to the light, is a lot more bright and then as you move here, the foliage builds up, the light can't penetrate it to the same level because there's just too much of it and then it gets darker as we move towards the back of the clusters and the back being the area that we are closest to. So, that worked really well. I love that, I love it a lot. We're going to put our brush down. 
we're going to switch back to the one inch flat headed brush. We will double up our initial mixture to begin, but we're going to make it darker. So we'll double the amount of Mars black that we had, if not triple. There we go. We'll still add just a hint of titanium white. While we're adding a lot more Mars black, we're not adding more titanium white. At least, not anything more than our initial mixture called for. Making my brush damp again, grabbing our pigment, and this is where we're going to start building up some of the foliage that's, again, in the middle of the cluster and towards the back. The areas in which are closer to us physically. We're not going to try to cover all of our previous applications because realistically there are going to be openings in our trees. Remember this area is going to be very full. But I'm not going to fill out everything to a grand amount initially. We want to pace it and we want to go back to other areas here. I'm just doing the back of this tree. As you can see, we need the back of this tree. Don't want to get too close to this center bright portion though. This top area has a lot of foliage. Rotating my brush. Oh, it's really starting to come along. And it's going to look a lot better, by the way. I'm quite excited to see how this turns out. A lot of this I, I like to do on other canvases before I teach it and show you and do little practices, but I didn't go ahead and do this part yet. Because I felt like I had a, a, good, a good vision for it. Felt like everything was going to work well. It all made sense. So here we're actually seeing it together for the first time. Where with a lot of these lessons, I see it on a, a different canvas first. Which, by the way, is a great technique. If you're ever unsure about a technique or a color, grab out another canvas and maybe even allocate specific canvases for testing and just test it. Give it a go. Give it a try. Often, you'll learn a lot and your end result will be a lot better for it. No, I do that when I really, really care about a piece, but also when I want to make you these lessons and ensure that they are really good. Everything they can be. Everything a lesson should be. Here covering up a lot of my branches again, it's okay. Here I do want it to be a little bit more thick in this area. Yeah, leaning back, checking. Uh, though I am almost out of paint and our brush, while it still has the paint on it, is probably going to start drying. So I'm actually going to take off all of the paint that's remaining, I'm going to wash it, just putting it in some water, taking it out, wiping it on some paper towel or some cloth. I also often get asked the question, how much water do I use? When I'm cleaning a brush, a lot. I fully submerge the brush. I go back and forth between paper towel or painting cloth and water, you know, 10 times maybe, if not running it under the sink. But when I'm just making my brush damp for an application like the trees or something of that nature, the grass, I only dip the bottom third of my brush into it and, oh no, I'm spilling water. Oh no, I'm spilling a lot of water. Okay, uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> uh, I, when, I, when I paint these, my water dish is actually quite far away from me and I kind of have to kind of have to reach, but apparently I had to reach a little too much. I'll see you in a second. Well, we are, we are back and dry in a dry setting. Thank goodness. I normally used to cut that sort of thing out, but I think this sort of thing happens to all of us. And maybe, maybe it makes these longer lessons a little bit more fun. But for all of you who have accidentally taken your brush, dipped it in a little bit of coffee, or water, uh, not necessarily your painting water, and then going to drink it. It's happened to all of us. 
We all do these things. Don't feel embarrassed. If anything, it, um, it adds character. So anyways, getting back to the actual lesson. We cleaned our brush because the paint was drying on it, though we are going to use it again. I'm going to grab a lot of that burnt sienna. Again, equal amount of our Naples yellow. Love the color these create. Probably one of my favorite fall pigments. We're going to be doing a lot of fall pigments soon. Here, it's more so just light moving through foliage, making it look warmer. But once we have that, we are going to grab a lot more of our Mars black. We're continuously making it darker. We're building up what we had. We'll grab a hint of our titanium white. And if you feel it gets too desaturated, the best color to add is slightly more burnt sienna. It's a very saturated pigment. It's a very thin pigment, but it will really bring that color back to life quickly. Where the Naples yellow is very desaturated and it won't do too much for your saturation. In fact, you can almost use it to desaturate pigments in a lot of scenarios. That said, going back to our fan brush, making sure it's nice and damp, taking off the excess water. You can see we have all of those little bristle heads. Grab that pigment. And we'll go in yet again, building up the backs of our clusters, rotating our brush very frequently. We are going to have to go in with an even darker pigment, but the more you can stagger it, generally the better it's going to look. That's why we're taking our time and we're not just doing two or three applications. We spent a long time on our grass, on the rest of our painting, and it just doesn't make sense to start rushing it now, right? So, trying to let the edges that are closest to the sun, so here, here, remain a bit brighter, where the darker pigments are going on the opposite side, for the most part. It's not an always rule, but it is a general rule. We'll do some extra little taps down here, cover up the back of this tree a little bit. I think that can look nice. Over here as well. You'll also find that you have smaller pieces of your fan brush and larger ones, so you can paint with the individual pieces should you choose. Just give you some extra option. So far, so good. We'll put our brush down. We will grab our one inch. We will grab more Mars black. And I'm going to leave half of this as it was. Simply, you know what, maybe I'm not. I'm going to leave a little bit. <laughs> we'll also grab some of our Naples yellow to brighten it up. Won't add much saturation, but it will brighten it. And of course our burnt sienna. So here you can see what we were just using. Here you can see our new pigment. And I just wanted to leave some so that we can compare and contrast and ensure that we were actually making it darker. We did succeed. So back to the fan brush. There we go. And now we can build some real depth. Again, this is a cluster, so I'm going to the top of it because the top is the farthest point from the light. Then here we have another cluster. I'm not going to start on the bottom. I'm going to go towards the top and I'll blend down. Not actually blending, but we are creating a gradient. And then in a tree like this, you'll have multiple clusters. So this is the back of one, which can be darker, and then here's another. So the front, the area that's closest to the light will be lighter and we'll go to the back of it. And I know that the clusters are fairly nebulous design-wise at this point. So you do have to use your imagination a little bit, but if you continuously do a cluster cluster, it will visually start to form the idea and the movement of light that you have in your head. It's probably not going to be hyper evident with the first couple, but the more you work within those confines of 
that lighting source, the more it'll make sense visually. There we go. A couple little stray ones that are just blocked by miniature leaves or just closer to us or are just darker by nature. I'm not going to do too many in the background there. That will do a couple. A couple little taps. There we go. And you can tell that I'm slowly filling it out. It was very open initially. We're just taking our time, we're building it up, and we're getting it where we really want it to be. Obviously, every time we go back in and do this, while we darken the back clusters, we're also inevitably covering openings that were previously there. So we're eliminating sky. How full you want these, to, uh, these trees to be, it's up to you. I'm going for something similar to the reference photo, though not copying it exactly. Doing a little bit more myself, just because I really want to emphasize the light in the center. So we have a bit more of a, a vignette effect occurring at the top, which I like a lot. Speaking of which, we'll make that top corner a little bit darker. There we go. Let's take a step back, see how it's working. So I'm actually really glad we decided to take the step back when we did because something interesting is happening. Something I warn you against as frequently as I possibly can. And I, I know in the comments that a lot of you have noted, I use this word a lot. It's because it's important. It's not as cohesive as it could be. We were up close to the painting, at least to a point, working on this area. Loved it, very happy. We take our step back and what do we realize? This area of the painting is significantly more warm than this area of the painting and we essentially have a two color split. The painting is essentially broken in half. Why did this happen? Because we used exclusively these colors for the bottom and exclusively these colors for the top. The way of working it together is to start taking colors from the top, putting them in the bottom, bottom to top, etc. Now, how do we do that? We look for natural ways of going about it. Often that is done through light and either highlights or shadows. So we have this warm light it's working through all of our foliage. It also makes sense that it would work its way along the edges of our trees, right? So the light's coming this way. This edge probably has a highlight. This one may be a slight highlight, not as dramatic. On this side, the light's coming this way. So this side to the right of our tree, it's going to be a bit brighter left side a bit darker. We can do that for the backing trees as well and we can also interject a little bit more of the warmth down into here. We can also take some of our darker green from this, move it up into there. So quite a few different things we can do. I'm going to start with the transition of our green because I think that is important. Here we have our pigment that we were using for the darker applications. I really like having this here just as a reference, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm just going to take some of this, move it over there, interject about one third sap green, grab our fan brush, and I'll just tap that into the clusters. It's very subtle right now, but it's a way to get us started. And you can make it significantly more dramatic as you go. That said, let's see how the colors really compare up close. And I'm going to paint it up close, but I want you to frequently look at it from farther away and take those steps back because that is really important right now as you are trying to merge these two areas together. So I mixed up a little bit more of our green here. And we're going to start in the darkest clusters. We might not need to add too much of this. So we're going to be sparing with our first applications. 
Haven't really gone back to our palette yet. Just kind of throwing this in where we can. We'll have a couple loose little pieces just so that it doesn't feel like it solely exists within certain areas or categories. And honestly, I think that's almost all we need to do. I think we need to, to be a little bit more sporadic, a little bit more full, randomized, but I think we're almost there. I think this area may have gotten too dark. And what you can do in those scenarios, I'm going to clean my brush off quite well, and I will do some mixing with the fan brush, it is achievable. We're going to mix back to a slightly brighter variant of what we had. I grab some titanium white, re-interject some saturation. You can see how blending with this brush isn't perfect, but certainly doable. I'm going to take a lot of that paint off so that I have yet again my individual little clusters of bristles. So there we have those, we'll grab that. So if your dark areas get a little too dark, they feel flat, you can reincorporate this, and this is essentially just little leaves that protrude out from the backs of those clusters to the point where they can catch extra light again. So there is technical reasoning as to why it should be there. It isn't simply just, well, I thought it would look nice. So there, there is proper validation, which is always nice when we're working on pieces in styles like this. Here, brightening it up slightly more, cleaning my brush, actually cleaning it so that I don't <laughs> have too, too much paint. And going back into some of these more dense areas. There we are. So now we have the greens, can be a bit more cohesive, but we've added some extra light in there because things got a little bit too dark. With that, might also take this slightly brighter pigment, move it over a tree a little bit more. And now, I think it's time to start working with the next step. Now we are a little bit lower on the canvas and we are back to our liner brush. We're going to grab some of the mid value that we used for the leaves. We're going to say the sun is here. We're going to go to the left hand side of this tree because that is the side that's facing the light. We're going to go from the top using multiple strokes. We'll work our way downwards. We'll have it spaced out a little bit and we can even work inwards as we start to run out of paint and it gets just to be more of a watery mixture on our brush. And this is how we're going to add some texture to our trees and some additional bark. And we're just going to drag this out until we fully run out of pigment, just like that. This is another really easy way of taking that warmer light that we have in the background and working it into our foreground, though we do need to work this on the larger portions of our branches, even up higher in the painting. And because we are working with acrylics and they are inherently fairly thin, remember, if you want it to be more prominent, we just go over it multiple times because the layer we're working on top of is quite dark. And therefore we're getting a combination of the color on our palette and that dark pigment. But when you build it up, you get a combination of the previous pigment, which is a combination of your palette pigment and your dark pigment, and the new palette pigment. So every time you add it, you're working on a new, slightly brighter base layer. So that's essentially what we're doing there. You can see I'm going back to this area a couple of times, just because I feel it's notable, important. We can have it over on this tree. And doing the consistent smaller taps isn't as important 
as we move into the background because you're just not going to be able to see that much detail. But for the two here, you definitely want a lot of that and we'll have a little bit of it here in the background. There we are. It's also something you can build up. By the way, this one uh, was done on the left hand side of our tree on the right hand side of the canvas because this tree is on the left hand side of the sun. We're going to be painting the highlight on the right hand side. So opposite to this one because the opposite side of the tree faces the light. You can use a smaller liner brush if you'd like. I just found that this one worked quite well from the beginning. I like the sizing for our size of canvas. But you can also use both. I know that you're a bit farther away, but again, the point of this application was really just to tie the top and the bottom of the piece together better. And you best experience that from a distance. There we go. I'm going to cover a lot of our tree in the background here with it, just because we're going to have a lot of that warm light on these trees. They're just so close. Same goes with this one. Covering up large portions of our branches. Even the small ones. And we can do more of that up here because this is also quite close to the light. At least it's going to have a very direct interaction with it as it doesn't have foliage kind of getting in the way. Go over it a couple times, build it up. Really like how this is turning out. And again, it's going to look a whole lot better soon. There we go. Do you think I need to make it slightly darker? Right on the back here, just so the tree still stands out against the darker values that we have already set in. And you can go back and forth with a lot of these. Until you find the right balance and mix that you really, really like. There we go. Now I figured we'd do at least one little section here close together. I'm going to brighten up my pigment, make it slightly more saturated for this next highlight. Just because we are building up and this is a prominent spot that can really do a lot for us. So we're starting on that edge, occasionally doing a little tap inwards, trying to create sharp markings. We don't want soft markings. This is wood and it's close to us so we do see a lot of that detail. Now I am running out of paint so I'm working my way in. Sometimes I'm making a mark, sometimes I'm not, but I'm not forcing it. I'm not applying too much pressure. If I get too much paint on there, I might use my pinky finger to soften it a little bit. There we go. And yet again, we can brighten it, adding a little bit of titanium white, a little bit more of our Naples yellow. And that's exactly what I wanted. That's perfect. And if you don't feel it's too strong, you can interject it in other trees as well. Moving it back a little bit and I might add a hint to the other side, but not much. Stepping back, I, I think it is quite evident that taking those warms down into more of the green area and interjecting the greens up into the top really helped bring it together. But we're still not done and we're still have quite a bit to do. It's going to look really, really atmospheric once we're at that point. But with that, we're going to move a bit closer here and play 
more so with what the sun is doing. So, we have light coming from right here, but this area seems relatively unaffected, right? And that's because it is. We'll grab some of our burnt sienna, our Naples yellow, mix those two together, grab a hint of our titanium white, make sure that it's a bit thicker and less saturated, and the smallest hint of Mars black possible, barely, barely even noticeable on the brush, if you can. We'll work that in. We're going to go to the drawn on trees that we have in the back of the tree line. We did this with a fan brush, but we're now going back in with the liner brush. I'm tapping above all of them by a little bit, and then I'm overlapping a lot of it, starting in that middle portion where we're going to have the majority of that light, and then we'll have it dissipate as we move towards both the left and the right hand side. Just like that. So just like these two trees are receiving the most amount of light and are a bit more orange because of it, the backing trees are also going to receive that same idea and technique. And then we'll just have it dissipate as we move off towards the edges. Working my way around these trees, it's a good start. We'll get more titanium white and more of our Naples yellow because we do need to brighten it. Make it a bit more thick. Again, going into the top. We're not going to go as low or as far to the left or right with this mixture. There we go. Now, yet again, titanium white. Naples yellow. Continuing to build. And that's gorgeous. That is what we were working for. We can also apply portions of this greater highlight into our tree. Have limbs and branches kind of get lost in that light. Much better. The next step here is a bit of a dramatic one. It's not going to be our final step, we're going to do a couple of other things after this, but this is something that will really bring the piece together, and it's something that you don't have to do. It's something I'd recommend you watch me do first and decide if you want to interject it in your piece. It's really only something you do if you feel that the top is so disjointed from the bottom, and it's a relatively common painting technique, but not something everybody's really jumped into. It's also something where if you haven't done, I would recommend testing it on another canvas first if you do decide you want to go ahead and do this. That said, for the next step, you first need to make sure that the entirety of what you're going to be painting over is dry. All of this, no wet paint, no issue. I'm going to be going in with a one inch flat headed brush and I'm going to be doing a glaze, which is essentially when you just add a very, very thin layer of pigment to your painting. And it's thin to the point where you don't hinder any of your old marks, your subjects, and it has a very minimal effect on your actual values. The purpose of a glaze generally is to change the hue a little bit, to make it a little bit warmer, to make it a little bit cooler, to interject an additional color to just make it slightly more complex. And we do this with a very watered down pigment. You can do it with additional pigments or rather mediums which you buy in store and mix with your paints, but I've always found that water actually just works great uh, with these acrylics. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to dip our brush in a lot of water. We're going to wipe it off once, maybe twice, the brush is significantly more damp than it normally is. I'm going to grab a very minimal amount of my uh, burnt umber, and as you can see here on the palette, it's very watery. I'm going to grab a very minimal amount of our Naples yellow, about an equal mixture, and I'm going to spread those out. You can see just how watery that is on the palette. It's much more like watercolor than it is acrylic. Now, I do need more of this, 
So I'm going to double up both of my pigments and I'm going to double up the amount of water. It's essentially dripping on my palette now, which can be a little inconvenient, but the more thin this pigment is, the better it'll be for building it up over time. Once we have our pigment though, and it's on our brush, we simply go to the area in which we want to make warmer. We just go over the canvas, back and forth. You can move it over your trees if you want, but if you do, you need to move it up them. So, slightly warmer, I like that. Grab a bit more water, grab what we have on our palette, work that over the foreground, bring it all the way down, that's important. If you suddenly stop in the middle because you say, oh, that has enough, it will look awkward. We definitely need more paint though, so more burnt sienna, more Naples yellow, more water. Now, you will probably come to a point where you've applied too much water to the canvas and therefore you can't apply additional color because every time you work the brush on, you essentially just strip the color off. In that scenario, just let it dry and come back to it. I think this is dried for the most part, so I'm going to apply a second layer to the backing. And I'm going to use my finger to just take some of that pigment off of our trees, which you can avoid if you'd like to. That said, this is something that takes time, takes a bit of a process. I'm going to let this dry for 10 minutes. I'm going to move you closer, and you can see a bit closer how we go about actually applying it in our brush application, all of that good stuff. So, again, not something you all need to do. <laughs> it really depends on if you feel like this fits with this, but it's a great technique that can really add a lot to a painting much later on in its process of life. It's been about 10 minutes. We are closer to the canvas, and the canvas is fully dry to the touch. So, going back to my fairly wet one inch flat headed brush, Grab some of our burnt sienna, equal mixture of our Naples yellow. And you might even want slightly more of one or the other. If you feel like it needs a lot more saturation, use more burnt sienna. If you feel like it needs more warmth but less saturation, then use the Naples yellow. Grab some additional water to further thin this very watery pigment. It's quite noticeable the consistency when we have it on top of the white here, and that's essentially why we're doing it in that spot. But with that, we're going to head back up here. Really gives it that warm glow. Grab more. Head over to our other side. Using a very soft application, if we applied the brush with hard pressure, we'd end up getting something that had a lot of strokes and streaks to both sides of the brush as it would push the paint to both sides. So something to consider, we do go in with a bit of a softer application. We're going to mix more of our paint. Grab slightly more water. And I do think I'll avoid our tree this time just because I felt like it was building up to uh, quite the degree last time. Ran out of paint right about here, but I continued the motion all the way to the bottom, just so that we didn't have any awkward visuals, awkward stops. There we are. And I think it's very close to being what I want it to be. We might just add one more quick application Need a lot of water for that. Bring it down. There we go. Really making it warmer. You do have to be careful with the Naples yellow in the mix. Very specifically as you get towards shadows, like what we have at the bottom, because it is a thicker pigment. 
So even when it's watery, it can change the value a little bit. The burnt sienna runs significantly less of a risk of doing that because it's very, very thin. But all of your paints will react differently with glazes. That's why it's important, or just a good idea, to try occasionally using uh, different canvases, doing little tests, figuring out how thick or thin a pigment is, and then going from there. But I really, really like the glaze in general. I feel like it made that so much warmer, uh, really added to the atmosphere. We can go back and add more to the flowers to brighten them up. In this process, we did make it all much more uniform so they pop less. I think I actually like it that way, but it is something you can do. With that, there are a couple more things we can do with this piece. Upon stepping back and seeing the piece as a whole, we can look at the highlights that we have within the leaves and continue to build them up, but very specifically using our smaller liner brushes. So here, we'll grab some of our burnt sienna, equal mixture of our Naples yellow, hint of our titanium white, but not much because we don't want to desaturate it too much. And we can say, okay, the light's hitting this edge, but you know what, this area is protruding too. It should catch light, so I'm going in with just a myriad of little taps. Bring some light to areas that were previously dark, and this is a way of, again, reworking spots that ended up having slightly too much in terms of our fan brush applications. So we can always go back and play with these things, make sure that they're balanced as well as we want, and while this takes a lot longer than using the fan brush, it's much more precise. I generally like to begin with the fan brush because that randomized element is something that can be difficult to do with this, and you do want that randomization. It's going to make it look a lot better. But once you have that randomization, you're probably going to want to fine tune different clusters in there. So this is how we go ahead and we do that. I'm going to jump around, but for the most part, these are all going to be applied to areas that protrude and catch additional light and therefore are in some way facing this light, to a point. There are exceptions, but it's the general idea and rule. So we'll go ahead and we'll just mix up a bit more of that. Don't want to do too much near the top corners because I am still working for that nice vignette effect. There we go, we can even add little individual applications down here. Like that, like that a lot. If you make an area too bright, you can always go back to the darker pigment and separate them. And you can kind of just work back and forth until you end up with what you really want in terms of spacing and clusters of highlighted and darker foliage. The next thing we can do is we essentially applied our trees and then we put our foliage on top of it, leaving some of the branches to show through, covering some of the branches, which created depth. But realistically, some of the branches should reemerge and then be on top of our foliage. So still using our smaller liner brush, grabbing some Mars Black, maybe a little bit of burnt sienna because we'll be working on smaller branches that light will be moving through to a point. Our Naples Yellow, hint of our Titanium White. This is another thing that can be done from far away but close up. It really depends. I'm going to be painting it from much farther away so that I can see balance, but recognize that it is something you can approach from uh, less of a distance, should you choose. So much about painting is preference, and I know we talked about this earlier in the lesson, but these are really meant to guide you, to give you an idea of what you're doing, to teach you some new methods and techniques, but not not to handcuff you, not to say you should do this and only this. If you have a style that you love to paint in, if you have a subject that you like to paint a certain way, if you have a color palette that you adore, perhaps you have a 
gold green instead of a sap green and you really prefer it over the sap green, go ahead, make those changes, have fun with it, make it your own. I, again, would love to help you in your painting endeavors, help you move forward and ensure that you're learning, that you know, you're know you not becoming stagnant or you know that you can take these ideas and move them into your own pieces. I, I think that's always the larger goal. That's why we talk about not only what we're doing, but why and how we're going about it. That way, again, you can take these and interject them into your own works at some point. But I, I really don't want you to ever feel like you have to do it the exact same way I am. You don't have to do the glaze. You don't have to go back in and add all of these branches if you feel like you already have enough. It is your painting and you are more than welcome to work with it in the way that you like to. So with that, we actually are coming towards the end of the lesson. I'm essentially just applying some smaller branches at this point. I really like how the colors came together. Really like the mood, the warmth, the level of detail. It's inherently a relatively simple painting, right? Just compositionally. But I think we were able to do a lot with it. I think the time we spent on it really alludes to that. And I really thank you for spending this time here with me today. I love that there's still an interest and a joy to be had and experienced with traditional art like this. I think painting is something that I'll always love. It's something that, you know, I think it's relaxing, it's expressive, it's creative. It's a way to kind of escape, but also dive deeper into ideas. It can be so much to all of us. And I, I just, I, again, I, I really appreciate that you're here watching, enjoying the lesson with me. If you did make it to this point, let's let's use a keyword. We always do this at the end of the lessons. It's for those of you who make it this far, it's a little badge of honor that you can use in the comments. You can either type it or you can incorporate it in a sentence, but it lets me and everybody else know that you did make it towards the end. You were one of the dedicated few. I think on average, 13% of people make it to the end of these videos. So if you're part of that 13%, you can include seasons change or some variation of that in the comments or um, as a portion of your comment and it'll just uh, again be a little little note that you were you were here to see it all come together and if you are very much congratulate you on being so dedicated to the craft I, I think that it's a good sign that you'll end up making something you really love. Also, as we uh, approach the end here, again, I would like to say a big shout out and thank you to everybody who does support the channel up over on Patreon. You literally make these happen. Could not do it without you. Could not spend the time on these without you. And I'm very grateful that I can spend the time making these longer lessons rather than, you know, that quicker speed painting or something of that nature. I really enjoy the act of teaching and hope you took a lot out of it but thank you for providing us with this opportunity to make this here today and all of the lessons that will come after if you're new to the channel and you'd like to support the channel patreon is the way to do it it's a great way to say thank you but it's also a great way to get the traceables the reference photo so you can have color matching help you can have help with the drawing but we also have an exclusive facebook group which is only available to the patrons where you can share your work with a bunch of like-minded people who are working on similar pieces. So you get to see different iterations and ideas, which I always think is one of the really neat parts of it. Uh, but also just, you know, ask for help from the community, ask for suggestions. Additionally, you can get access to all five of my eBooks, which includes Acrylics for Beginners, which is essentially the essentials. Everything you need to know about acrylic painting before you jump into your first acrylic painting. And in that we do talk more about glazing, composition, mixing colors, what brushes to use, really all of that good stuff. Um, oh, I think I have a, a text from my mom. That's nice. Uh, but, yeah, 
If you're interested in supporting the channel up on Patreon, you're more than welcome to. There's a link in the description. I always very much appreciate it, but you don't have to. And again, don't feel guilty if you can't. I know that uh, right now for a lot of people that's just not doable and it's totally understandable. But to those of you who do, you literally keep this channel running, so big thank you. I hope everybody has very much enjoyed the lesson here today. I've loved bringing this together. I think that it turned out even better than I expected. Took some extra time. Did this lesson on a couple of different canvases and I, I think it paid off. So I'm very happy. I'm going to clean up the remainder of the water that I spilled earlier. I hope you enjoy. And also a friendly reminder, do take little breaks. Make sure you're eating, make sure you're staying hydrated, all that good stuff. So easy to forget, but thank you. And above all, as always, stay creative.